2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, could you please call the roll? Corey Fellows. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Nicholas McGee. Here. Richard Duperry. Here. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Thank you. Uh, next item is approval of minutes from the October 9th, 2018 meeting. So moved. We have a motion. So moved. A second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. First action item, number five on the agenda. The planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance, to amend section J, temporary signs. Uh, does staff have an intro yep. for this? Actually, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, this is actually a, a pretty um, small amendment to a, a suite of amendments that were made about a year ago. Um, as planning board members may recall, the town updated our sign ordinances to be compliant with the Supreme Court case that really talked about how we can't uh, regulate for content, but we can regulate for size and location, those sorts of things. Anyway, in the uh, intervening time, uh, year that's passed, uh, our town manager, uh, assistant town manager has worked with the ordinance committee um, to bring forward this uh, amendment to you, which really brings the temporary sign provisions with for signs in the right-of-way uh, to be consistent with uh, state statute around the amount of time that the signs can be located in the right-of-way and the uh, notification for who placed the signs um, and it's, um, that, it's that discreet so I'll leave it at that thanks Jay um, with that we will have a public hearing I just ask that um, as will be the case throughout the evening uh, if you do come up to the podium, please introduce yourself, give your name and address. Please keep your comments to five minutes or less, and I will open the public hearing. Do we have any takers? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Are there any board comments or questions on this item? Rachel? Yeah, I am looking at, at the changes, and what's eliminated there, I gather, is the phone number of the person placing the sign. As the ordinance currently works in practice, if a sign is in an incorrect place, the uh, Public Works Department removes it, brings it to the town clerk, and the town clerk calls the campaign. Uh, if we are now going simply to an address, is the town clerk going to be sending registered letters, regular letters, uh, with all of the extra work that that involves for the town clerk? and the additional expense. So as these changes go, not the, 12, not the six to 12 weeks, but as the changes go, both the town work clerk has additional work and the campaigns will be disadvantaged. Okay. I, yeah. I, I just want clarification. Is the 12 weeks standard for state of the main language for the sign placement period? <coughs> Period it can be held. We know. That is my understanding. That's, That's what I've been told, yes. I, I personally favor the shorter time frame. I don't think anyone really enjoys political sign season. Um, I'm, while I'm all in favor of trying to bring it in line with maybe some federal and state statutes with regards to the rest of this language they're changing, <coughs> I think the length of period I think is wise in our part to limit that time. Three months is a long time to have political signs hang around. That's just my opinion. I respectfully disagree with Nick because we have um, signs from people who are not necessarily living in town and they may not be totally familiar with everything, you know, pertaining to the ordinance. So where they may be familiar with what's consistent with other communities around here. So I think it might be helpful to be somewhat consistent. Okay. Anyone else? Rachel? Yeah, the, um, the switch to the, the 12 weeks create some interesting dynamics in terms of enforcement. Uh, so if a sign says elect Joe Smith to, as representative and it's put up as part of the primary, 
then that person has, let's say, 12 weeks to have that sign up. If the person then wins the primary, that person cannot post the same sign for the general election. Uh, if somebody decides not to enter a primary, and this would be particular to the uh, town council, the school board, and the sanitary district elections, that would mean that some people can have their signs up for 12 weeks without actually um, our knowing what the deadline is or how long they're going to have them up there. And other people can only have their signs up there for six weeks, and it creates a lot of confusion in terms of enforcement, and it would require the DPW to actually get out and look at every single sign to see which sign was up there in May, and which sign came up in August, and which sign came up in September. So it does create some, by simply having a blanket 12 weeks, it creates some real enforcement issues. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on that. Um, I actually think it's a problem with the language. I, I think what it really should state is the amount of time that's out prior to an election when the person is up for office rather than just in a calendar year. Because as, as our colleague has pointed out, that enforcement provision, of it was out for one week and I, I swear I saw it for a week. You know, they only have 11 left. I think that's a huge issue. So I think it really should be based on the set the election date is on and the time frame they allow it to pr appear prior to election date. That's really what the time frames should be based on. Um, and then, just to point out, 12 weeks, if somebody didn't have a primary and they did go, we would be seeing campaign signs in August, in the middle of our summer, and every vacationer here can see our streets that are released. That's, that's a long time. Just Thanks. one bit of clarification. Um, when this talks about temporary signs, while we often, and I even often think of these as political signs, they could be business signs. They could be you know, roof repair. <coughs> painters, what have you. Um, again, the, the, the Supreme Court found that we can't regulate for content. Um, so this is temporary signs in general. Obviously, uh, political signs are what we mostly see, but I just want to be sure there's a point of clarity there around that. Thanks, Jay. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, this gets into, frankly, some, sort of some uh, inside baseball. <laughs> in a way when it comes to some of the nuances of, of campaigning and the campaign seasons. I, and I, I do appreciate that we have a couple people here who are able to speak to that. Um, you know, we're, we're not acting on this formally. We're not even really giving, giving an advisory opinion on this. Um, we held a public hearing, and I trust that our comments will be passed along to the council and taken into consideration as appropriate. I will say that while I Definitely am right with Mr. McGee and in, in not liking, uh, not being a big fan of sign pollution. Um, I do understand the spirit behind the the ruling and the um, these amendments to the ordinance to sort of err on the side of free speech, essentially, um, even though it's not strictly limited to campaign signage. So uh, again, we'll trust that the council will take these comments into consideration. So, thank you. The next item on our agenda, number six, BPJ LLC requests a sketch plan review for 1500 Technology Way Assessor's Map <coughs> U39, lot 4730. No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is uh, located in the Hygis Parkway Zone. It's the main veterinary medical clinic. Um, it's located at the end of Technology Way, off the cul-de-sac, as you can see on the site plan. <coughs> so the applicants in front of the board tonight for a sketch plan review. Uh, they're proposing a 2,800-square-foot, 2, one-story building addition to their existing facility. Uh, the addition will consist of additional examination areas. Uh, just a quick reminder that a sketch plan review is an opportunity for the board and the applicant to have a high-level discussion about the proposed project. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you. So again, this is preliminary sketch plan. Um, the applicant and their team can, can assume that we've, we've reviewed the materials. And uh, with that, we'll hand it over to you for a brief uh, overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy with Stantec here on behalf of uh, the Maine Veterinary Medical Clinic. Uh, Dr. Potoff is here, and uh, the architect for the project, uh, Mike Steichser, is here as well. Uh, last, we were before you a couple of years ago to show uh, 
uh, you and get approval for a mobile MRI unit and a parking lot. So here on the site plan is that parking lot area that has now been constructed and the MRI is parked over here out behind the building. So we're at 1500 Technology Ways at the very end, it's the last parcel more or less on the right uh, of the cul-de-sac. The existing building going back some 10 years I think or maybe even 12 years, 2006 or so. Angela would know, she did the original design uh, for it. Um, so they've been in operation, they've got a parking lot here and again that expansion area. We're here before you with the sketch plan for an expansion to the building that will account for some new exam space and uh, ancillary uh, space. About 2,800 square feet onto a little over 13,000 square feet now, yielding roughly 16,000 square feet or so. Parking lot has 74 parking spaces today with that addition, additional parking that we uh, did here a year ago or so, and uh, under code at uh, four per thousand, we'd need 68 spaces, I think it is, so we still have a little bit of excess, so this proposal only really includes the building expansion area. Uh, the building's fully sprinklered now, and it'll be addition, uh, the addition will have a sprinkler system expansion to it. Uh, one key utility piece uh, that we have to contend with is the relocation of a transformer pad, pad mounted transformer. You will note, though, a uh, key element to this e expansion is its proximity to the setbacks, both on the rear and the side line. So uh, we are very close to those, but we are within the setback areas. There will be a little bit of clearing that will uh, need to be defined to allow for the construction. Single story construction. I'm going to point or show you a couple of uh, different images here, and then I'll, I'll show uh, a graphic of the building and how this whole expansion kind of fits in. This is a little older aerial image, just gives you some sense though of the pitched roof condition of the existing structure coming off the end of uh, Technology Way. Existing parking lot, this image does not show the expansion area that was constructed here a year and a half ago. So these trees were removed in the north or east here would be the access into the Downs property. So we're, we're close to that certainly. This is just floor plan in in yellow is the expansion area here. So the existing uh, entrance into the buildings off into the front. So off to the rear side of the building would be this expansion area. Again, it's just a single story, bunch of exam rooms and, and the like. The MRI here, if you've been out there with a, a pet, it, it would be out in this back side. Again, this is just the architecture to give you a sense of the, the pitch roof condition, but I think the next image that I show you will really be the telling one with a little, little bit of color. <coughs> so that building addition here, single story, we had the pitched roofs, a couple of uh, comments and issues here, I suppose, with respect to the selection of using the single story uh, flat roof type condition, and that is one element is to try to maintain the uh, windows here on the existing part of the uh, building. So then as well, trying to work with this roof pitch here, it just really plays out well to have a flat roof. So well, there'll be some internal drainage that'll have to happen, and then that'll be tied into the, the drainage system. Uh, staff comment about stormwater management. This site with this addition will still only have uh, impervious coverage of about 50,000 square feet. Site is about two acres. The original design in, accounted for, I think it was over 70,000 square feet. So we're still well below. When they expect there's going to be much more that can be done on the site given setbacks and so forth. So the uh, stormwater management systems for the business park still well accommodate what we're doing with this with this project. We'll spell that out in our final submission with a little more formalized uh, reporting and so forth. So uh, that'll be the, the key element there. I think a couple other staff comments relate to traffic. We can provide a little bit more information on that. But the reality of uh, you know the proposal, we have 74 parking spaces. We're compliant with what the code requires for 
for parking, uh, so we're not really doing anything else other than the building addition. I think we'll probably have to pay a little bit more attention to the uh, side setback and the rear setback and what we may need for some landscape buffering enhancements, that type of thing, because of the proximity of the setbacks, but we'll, we'll build upon that in our final application piece. So I think with that, um, relatively straightforward building addition. Uh, I think this is a, a great use, highly successful at this point in time uh, here for its 12 years in the, in the community. So uh, we look forward to hopefully getting a successful approval from, from you folks at our next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Robin, would you like uh, to start? Sure. Um, just a real quick question. Um, it may be for the doctor, Steve, um, instead of you. But could you just um, just real quickly talk about the operational change um, as far as what the additional rooms will be for to demonstrate that what I'm getting at is that it won't be drawing additional traffic kind of a thing. So if you can just talk about the operations, operational change. Yeah, part of it is, is we more and more there's uh, uh, departments that require uh, ultrasounds and um, equipment in the rooms. Uh, and so we're, we're competing sort of for a couple rooms right now. Um, we'd like to get a cardiologist to join us, but mm -hmm. we really don't have the space for it. Uh, and so we're we're adding in six exam rooms, um, and that's that will still feed right from mm -hmm. um, the reception. It, it, it has a nice traffic flow as far as moving people in and out. Um, it, it, I doubt if it will change. Well, hopefully we'll get a little bit busier, but. Well, you have additional it's overall, employees. It, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It won't create an enormous amount more traffic. I okay. mean, if we get six exam rooms, that would, if everything was filled, uh, I mean, that your exams are typically a half hour to an hour sure. long. It's a, it, okay. it. It hopefully will increase our staff to some degree. Okay. I mean, we. Uh, Current count is over a hundred employees. Uh, so wow. I well, I congratulate you on having such a successful business right here in Scarborough. Thank you very much. And um, you know, these are the things that we will be looking for as far as you know the, the the waiver request from the traffic impact study is to talk about how many more employees will you be having, how many, how much more traffic um, in and out of the area will you be sort of generating, kind of right. a thing. And, and it's kind of a mixed blessing, you know, kind of a right. thing that you are so sure. successful and having things come in. Um, I think that uh, I, I just would, would um, uh, just ask that, Steve, you confirm your stormwater calculations with the engineer kind of thing. And um, let's see, what was the other thing I had s underlined here? With the proposed impervious area being added to the site, quantity and quality will be important for the board. Just knowing what watershed you're in and primarily, you know, that everything there drains to Scarborough Marsh and understanding that it's not just uh, quality, it's quantity as far as flooding is concerned there. So um, I just wish you well and thank you for having such a thriving business in Scarborough. Thank Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I, I also had a question on the increase in, in business and the uh, both with, with staff and in terms of the customers because that is a pretty substantial number of uh, new new rooms, new examining rooms, plus I believe you have a cat ward in there, which yeah. would require you know, some assistance in there. And that's probably two, at least half of that space is, is hospitalization space. So that's, that's as, you, as you come to us with your full proposal, I would like to see um, a little bit more about the proposed increase in the number of staff and any increase that you might expect in the number of customers, especially when they arrive, so that we can take a look at, and if you would please, take a look at the impact that might have on, on the traffic. Um, I think uh, at some point we're going to want to take a look at the materials that you're using, especially uh, get more information around the flat roof. Um, but I, I also, you know, wish you luck. I think you've uh, got a good business there and your value to the community. Thank you. Thanks. Rick? Um, yeah, you're going to hear this all the way down 
grow, I'm sure, about if you're increasing your area and your examination rooms, it doesn't make good business sense if you weren't expecting more customers. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, and I'm not a big fan of it. To some extent, people now have to wait to get into a room, so it actually can move. Okay. Yeah, just do a good job of you know, justifying that or, or presenting that, you know, as you move forward, because I'm sure everybody's going to ask the same question. Yeah, we'll it's only because everybody's got to pay the impact fee, so it's not fair to waive it for. Yeah, we'll if, if we'll we come back with uh, better numbers on the uh, either hourly and or daily uh, type of production and, and where those uh, trigger right. traffic. It's you know tied to how much business yeah. is coming through in the course of the day. So I have. I have lots of animals, so I understand if it's hospitalization space or something, it may not increase it, increase it, the flow that much. But you just have to present that and justify it. You know? um, if, if I might as well, since we do have the architect here, uh, if you wanted to ask a question about uh, architecture or anything like that, certainly feel free and have them come up. Uh, you may mention about materials or otherwise. We, can we probably talk about that's it. probably not actually for this particular. I mean, I'll let the chairman call it, but. This sketch plan review, we don't really need to see materials at this point, I don't think. Um, so, uh, are you not expanding the parking at all? Parking staying the same? Yes. Okay. Um, Steve, I really do like what you did with this uh, space and bulk requirements. That's a nice table. I wish everybody did that. We should make that a standard practice. How uh, you've got the requirements and then your actual. That's really nice. It saved me a lot of time looking through this. Um, and then I guess uh, that's all I really had, other than I just do have a question on the fire access. Um, and maybe it'll be clearer. Yeah, no, I can, you're, you're all right, you're on the half side of the building, so you're good. Okay. I, for for, a minute, one I, of the for original, a minute, I thought you were on the back side, which would have been more difficult to get to. So. Right. The, this area up here, they, uh, when they originally built the, the building, they did provide for a hard surface. It's grass, but there's a uh, hard surface there that the fire trucks could access. Curious to know where the fire department will stand. We haven't coordinated yet with them. Will they want to see that come out any further? The challenge being is that it's quite close to the property boundary then. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'd <coughs> like to hope that with what is here, and certainly on this side of the building and this side of the building now with the parking lot, that they would find that satisfactory at this point. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna, you, you probably will need to, you know, coordinate with them and bring that back for the next phase because that is, um, that is a question that's gonna come up. Other than that, it looks great and I'm glad to see you're doing well with the Scarborough. Thank you. Nick? Uh, I'm all set too. I just want to congratulate you for uh, needing to expand. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, I won't uh, really belabor it either. I think we've already pretty well covered covered the uh, the hot topics and the loose ends, and appreciate the overview and the work you've done to this point. Um, you know, as uh, Mr. DePerry mentioned, you know, the onus will be on the applicant to make the case and provide the data. Uh, to support any waiver requests, as, as would always be the case. Um, you know, as staff has noted, and this is obviously typical uh, coming out of sketch the sketch stage, we'll you know be looking for more detail on on the um, the function, the, the the intensity of the use, um, traffic, uh, photometrics plan, landscaping, obviously stormwater detail, so all the usual all the usual things. But um, with that. I think we've, we've, we've covered it, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration, unless you have any more questions or need more input from us at this point. No. I, 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 I will say just quickly that on the, the, the question on the, uh, whether it's viable to have a pitched roof, um, I guess I personally, and I, I don't think I'm hearing a, a lot of concern among my fellow board members, I wouldn't necessarily look for you to go to a pitched roof just for the sake of doing that, but I would encourage you and, and the architect more specifically to really look at what you can do to make that addition as, as complementary and um, um, 
compatible with the existing building as possible, whether that's through material, overall design elements, or, or what have you. And I would assume that that's something you'd want to do anyway. Um, you're just having a nice looking building. But I think there, there are other ways to, to make sure you're in compliance with those standards. So thank you. With that, good advice. Good thank you. Thank you. Good luck. good luck for the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Item number seven, the Mill Commons Development LLC requests a preliminary subdivision and site plan review for lot two of the Crossroads Plan Development District, phase one, assessor's map R52, lot four. Do you have a staff intro for this? Yes. So, um, as you stated, Mr. Chair, this is located in the Crossroads Plan Development District. Uh, this is Scarborough Downs, phase one. As the board may recall, the applicant did receive preliminary subdivision approval by the board for lot two at your meeting in August. Uh, we know that the board has reviewed this project many times now. However, the applicant is now proposing Mill Commons Drive as a public street and is before the board seeking approval of a re revised preliminary uh, subdivision plan. So uh, the applicant is requesting uh, several waivers um, from the street acceptance ordinance design standards, uh, most of which uh, staff is comfortable with. However, staff has had discussions with the Public Works Department, um, and from an operations and maintenance perspective, staff is uncomfortable with the board waiving the minimum centerline radius standard of 100 feet. I'll now ask Angela to touch on the merits of this waiver request. Thank so, I, thank you. I sat down with um, Mike Shaw and Steve Buckley, the de director and deputy director, and we, we had gone through um, the roadway standards and one of the things, as Jamel said, was the center line radius. And um, looking at some um, recently built denser neighborhoods, as well as those yet to be built, looking at some of the, um, the approved plans that have come through the planning board. And we're finding that um, those that are at that lesser, a lesser standard than the 100 are problematic and some of the feedback we're getting not only from town departments but as well as residents living in those those neighborhoods and those doing business in those neighborhoods whether it's small contractors or UPS or different things school buses um, so um, I know over the past few years some of these um, tighter neighborhoods um, have been now becoming online and that we're looking at actually accepting or looking at um, Eastern Village, Dunstan, those type of things. I think Sawgrass is another one. Um, and what we're finding is some lessons learned. And an example of that would be, um, you'll hear staff generally is encouraging the board to grant waivers for um, roadway widths, um, in decreasing the amount of impervious area. But what we found actually in the field for public works to be able to operate and maintain these streets where they have um, curb line, so there's the hard edge, the 10 foot travel lanes don't work. And so that's one of the examples that now um, you'll find that staff is encouraging 11 foot travel lanes in those cases. And I know the applicant is actually proposing that. Um, and that's an example of so, sort of those lessons learned. But what we're finding with some of these tighter radius though, um, and we do have some examples in town that we're actually working with those developers and moving curb lines be or trying to, to work with them on the design before they get installed um, because they're not functioning as intended. So um, what staff is encouraging is the applicant to either look at trying to hit that 100 foot minimum to become a public street or consider keeping it as a private street and building it to um, a lesser standard that might be acceptable for a private way. Thank you, and we'll certainly get to the, the applicant and, and then board discussion, but just for, if you wouldn't mind, for, as a frame of reference for people, just to, mm -hmm. so people can maybe visualize what it is we're talking about. Um, the applicant mm -hmm. is asking for 35 feet, what could you, just quickly give us a sense of what, what it is at, say, Dunstan Village and Eastern Village and so where there, the issues have been. Yep, so there are some, so the standard is 100 foot minimum. Um, there are some cases within Eastern Village that are significantly less, more of what they're proposing at the 40. 
foot mark, um, which again, um, we're finding are, are problematic where two-way traffic isn't really working. You're kind of having to wait for someone to get through. Um, what we're finding is Dunstan is meeting the 100 foot in that, dun in that more dense de development and um, we haven't had, we haven't got the feedback from those kind of functioning in those neighborhoods that um, we are in where it's not hitting it. So I guess that was kind of, as I put, kind of lesson learned in seeing the differences. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so thanks, staff, for the background. And with that, I will turn it over to the applicants team. Uh, thank you very much. Dan Bacon with Goral Palmer. I have Rocky Rispair here with me as well. Um, I think the board's seen uh, most of the elements of Lot 2 a number of times as Jamal introduced. So we'll limit our presentation and, and conversation, unless the board wants to go beyond mm -hmm. it, to really the the reason we're back before you for a preliminary uh, reapproval or amendment, and that's to um, propose a, a public street um, and meet to the public street acceptance standards to the extent that uh, we're able to with this design um, and talk to the board about waivers that we're seeking for this design. And with, in a lot of ways, uh, the Downs and the Crossroads project is balancing a lot of competing interests. Um, I think we've talked a lot about all the various other competing interests in the past around kind of wetlands and buffers, but also getting density and also providing affordable housing and walkability and complete streets and balancing that with the town's street acceptance standards that um, were, I think, crafted in an era that complete streets were less of a focus and moving cars uh, more efficiently was, was more of the focus than walking and biking and, and traffic calming. So, um, but that's why we're having the conversation with the board this evening to, to kind of balance out those and discuss those, those balances with this design. Um, as had been, has been introduced in the past, this is a fairly compact neighborhood design um, and that's on purpose. Uh, this is the, uh, the lot where we're proposing uh, four eight-unit garden condos along the Downs Road, and then eight additional duplex uh, buildings, so 16, um, 16 duplex units along this horseshoe-shaped uh, street that was originally proposed as a private street, is now proposed as a public street for a variety of reasons, including um, the utility companies wanting to see them see the street as public for them to accept the, the infrastructure, the, the utility infrastructure. So when we laid out um, the project in, in this lot originally, um, we had uh, quite tight um, uh, corners as uh, Angela introduced and uh, we added the right of way, we adjusted the garages some, and some other um, plan features to, to meet the town's 50-foot wide right-of-way requirement, and we, we adjusted um, some other details to meet town standards. Um, we got feedback from the town around uh, many of the waiver requests and support for, I think, all but the, the center line radius, as um, Ms. Blanchett introduced. Uh, when we submitted this revised preliminary design, um, we had uh, center line radius is at 35 and 40 feet. Um, since that time, that was two weeks ago, um, we've looked, we've got feedback from Public Works and the town engineer, and we've adjusted uh, the radiuses up to 75 feet. So it doesn't meet the 100 foot um, street acceptance standard, but made significant progress in terms of um, getting much closer to that standard. And um, according to Kind of engineering best practice and in, in Ashto, our traffic engineers looked at the radius and given the nature of the street, we're proposing it to be a 20 mile per hour street, not a 25 mile per hour street. Um, 75 feet is acceptable um, under Ashto for, again, a very slow moving street that's kind of walkable for, for pedestrians. Uh, we're intentionally creating really a kind of a grid layout. Um, to, to calm traffic and also to create 
um, a grid interconnected street system as the zoning calls for. Um, so we're not allowed to have um, or we're discouraged from having dead ends um, within this zone. And we're also intentionally designing the street um, with tighter corners and more of a grid layout to create the neighborhood character that we presented to you, I think, during the master plan process. The, the buildings have front porches um, that are designed to be across from the other duplex units to kind of create that more urban village environment. <coughs> and that's much more conducive when you're able to create um, more of a square street where buildings can be across the street from each other and not staggered along a radius. Um, in addition, We've been working with the energy, energy Committee as recently as last week around thinking about solar and all <laughs> renewable energy. Um, and we've also started a conversation with Revision Energy. And our goal is to, where possible, orient, orient the buildings and the roof areas um, to the south. And that's enabled, particularly on the, the four buildings um, duplex buildings on the upper side of the, the street is possible given the geometry of the street. And when you add a broad curve to both that side and the other, it really causes the buildings to have to crank around and not meet the south orientation. So that's something that's you know, a big consideration for our team in terms of um, providing that option for those lot buyers and also for for the units along the downs road so um, I think lastly one of our other rationales for again trying to come very close to the town standard but not meeting it and having a tighter tighter corners is to maintain as much of the um, the wetland common the the green space that's planned within um, this this lot there's a wetland that we're we're buffering um, with with landscaping and trails uh, that'll be used by the residents in some stormwater features, and the the more the square and the larger that area uh, can be, by by having a bit tighter curve on the southern southeastern end of the proposed road, um, really the better the programming there is for that that pocket neighborhood, and so that's been fairly deliberate. Uh, again, to have, to try to thread the needle between creating a grid, creating a block uh, neighborhood, but also meeting the town's street acceptance standards, which frankly are more kind of suburban oriented. They're more curvilinear streets versus grid streets. Um, and so that's a long way of getting to why we're seeking this waiver and seeking to strike a middle ground between um, our original design, which had very tight corners, and, and we acknowledge that, and getting as close to 100 as we can, while also not upsetting the apple cart in terms of the overall goals for this lot and the, the neighborhood we're trying to create. Um, so I think that's the, the big topic for tonight for the planning board, um, and what we're requesting uh, your support for, for a preliminary reapproval with, with this uh, layout again slightly amended from the one that you approved at the end of August uh, in addition to that there are a few other staff comments I just wanted to touch on uh, that that came out of the review uh, one is around kind of grading for building a which is the uh, most northerly building on the plan it's a eight unit garden uh, condo and um, again we're trying to create uh, a street wall, if you will, of units along the Downs Road. And that's enabled, um, and the parking for that building is enabled by grading that, uh, that goes down to the wetland. It does not impact the wetland. It stays outside of the wetland. Uh, these plans have been reviewed and approved by DEP. They have been uh, comfortable with uh, that design. And that slope, after the grading, will be revegetated in a turn back to, it'll just grow up and become natural. Um, that was brought up by, by staff questioning that. I think the other uh, key kind of stormwater related item that was included in the staff comments was around um, an outlet for um, 
up. I think it was a, an under drain, a stormwater feature behind, um, I think it's duplex three. I'm not, I can't see it from here, but I believe it's duplex three. So the upper, upper right duplex um, that goes into the 75 foot buffer to the tip tributary stream that, that is um, north of the project. That's necessary for a positive drain for, for that stormwater feature. We received DEP approval for, um, for, for that feature being installed within, within the buffer, and then that'll be revegetated and kind of go back um, and become part of the landscape. Um, but that's been approved through the NRPA process through DEP. Um, I think otherwise, the plan is, is, is largely the same to what you saw in late August, and we're uh, pleased to answer questions or have a dialogue with the board on the requested waivers. Great. Thank you. Um, first, we do have the opportunity for public comment, and if anyone would like to come up at this point. All right. Any takers? Um, so, again, uh, really tonight, this is, uh, we're sort of going back to preliminary subdivision view at this stage, and there's some other comments here. Mr. Bacon spoke to a couple of them that can probably be addressed more at sort of the final uh, site plan uh, review stage, but um, at least as I look at this, the real threshold question for preliminary, preliminary subdivision uh, approval uh, is the centerline radius question. So with that, um, let's kick it off, and do you want to start off, Roger? Sure. Do you have anything? Um, I, I want to talk about the roadway. Um, but before I do that, why don't we just get out of the way the sidewalk request from Public Works to increase the width of the sidewalk from nine feet, I mean, from eight feet to nine feet? Oh, um, I think you're talking about the on-street parking? On-street parking, on -street yes. Parking. Yes. We are prepared to, we haven't made those planned updates. We're prepared to make the on-street parking depth or width, however you want to look at it, um, nine feet versus eight. Um, to, to meet their needs. So that's, that's not an issue. Okay, good. Yep. Um, I, I guess regarding the, um, the, um, the issue here regarding the radius, I, I want to ask Angela, how do you, do you have any opinion about the 70, you said 70 feet or 75 feet? 75 feet is what's shown up here and what we've changed since the initial review from staff. It was 35 and 40 feet originally, correct? Um, I guess I go back to my original comments was that we have some tighter radii in town that um, kind of lessons learned that we're getting feedback not only from public works but others that are living in there those neighborhoods that it's too tight. Um, public works has obviously concerns an operational basis. <coughs> obviously winter ops is, is a big deal and um, trying to get through there and maintain this as a public street is a concern. Can you, uh, can you give us a frame of reference? For instance, Eastern Village, what is the radii there? Well, you, there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> primarily, what it would... They're all different. Because I know really that is really specific. tight. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There are, it, that, uh, Eastern Village does Let's get down. Let's choose an intersection at Eastern Village. Let's talk about oh, man, one. man, you're gonna... That, that, <laughs> I don't know that we have <laughs> that plan details. <laughs> all right. Us to, I, think you're, I will say it does go down to, to 35 or 40. There are some in Eastern Village. Okay, and you're that saying go that, that and, tight. At, and at Dunstan, it is 100? Yes. Yep. Well, <laughs> um, I'll be interested to hear what the rest of the board has to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nick? Yeah, so I think where I fall down on this is um, I'd want Public Works to be comfortable. If you're asking the town to accept the roadways, um, we're going to maintain them. They need to have comfort that they're going to be able to deal with it safely, that passengers, residents, everyone else is going to be happy with the end product. So, um, you know, if you're asking me tonight whether or not I'm okay with 75 feet, I don't really feel like it's a, an entirely fair question for me who doesn't operate any public works machinery. What I would prefer to see is the applicant um, try to work with public works a little bit on this and see if maybe there's an example of a 75 foot radii in town that um, public works is currently maintaining and they're comfortable with. I have one, but we haven't visited it together on site. But uh, the Sawgrass neighborhood, which is off the of Sawyer Road, um, has a between 70 and 80 uh, foot centerline radius. So we, we do know of one. So I think that's worth 
So it's investigating. Worth investigating is yes. where I would leave that because I, I, I don't think any, this is my personal opinion, I don't have enough information not having to have maintained those roadways, whether or not there, there is some larger safety concerns or what they're seeing as field conditions. So I think at that point, I'm forced to really defer to the comfort level of town staff, the public works department. And I, and I do believe there probably is, um, at least on my part, willingness to compromise on 100 feet as long as it, you know, the parties involved feel like there's, you know, they're safe about it, um, that they feel it can be worked. So uh, for what it's worth, I, you know, I'd like to see something uh, occur that, you know, whether it's through that meeting um, and maybe some feedback here from the board uh, based on that. So that's kind of where I fall on that. The rest of, um, you know, we'd like to take care of the 9P uh, width on the roadways for the parking spots. Um, the rest of the stuff I feel is, is probably administrative to some extent. Some so I'm, I'll stop from there. All right. Thanks, Nick. Robin? I, I'm also not comfortable uh, going against public works. Um, uh, decision to not accept anything less than a hundred foot radius and um, I think that there's another sort of organization to, to to consult with and that would be the school department knowing that buses won't go down into Eastern Village and that being some of the lessons that we need to learn from um, I think you know as you're trafficking you know it, a, a radius I guess let me ask you this Dan um, Knowing that 20 miles per hour on a 70 or 75 foot radius is Ashto acceptable, mm -hmm. is that with on street parking? Yeah, I think it, yes. Okay. It's not, it's because I think those are two competing interests there. Like, you know, we, we, we understand that, uh, I, I guess, competing interests when it comes to winter maintenance kind of a thing. Because when you go down into the Eastern Village, mm -hmm. it's very hard to maneuver those, those turns. Um, and I know that you're not asking for 35 feet. I, I get that. Um, but I feel like the town has already <laughs> compromised as well on the, the lane width, accepting going down from 24 to 22 feet um, kind of a thing. So I, I would echo what Nick is saying in that if, if Public Works who needs to um, service and maintain these streets is not comfortable, then I would not be comfortable going down below a 100-foot radius. Yeah, just in, just in terms of the on-street parking. I mean, th these radiuses are more customary in urban settings, mm -hmm. so it's not uncommon to have tighter corners with right. on-street parking. Yep. Um, I mean, when the planning board approved the master plan for this phase, um, like in some of your other zones, it specifically allowed streets to be 20 feet wide. Mm -hmm. We're not asking for 20 feet. That's yeah. a lesson learned um, from Eastern Village, as, as we've heard and are designing it at 22, and there was also expectations around, again, a grid layout, a tighter road system. Absolutely. So we're in this yeah. place where yep. we need to meet <clears throat> yep. a neighborhood design goal and also make sure it's serviceable and maintainable by, by the town. Um, I don't think school buses are envisioned to go through this street. I mean, it's a 250-foot walk from the farthest unit out to the Downs Road. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I would anticipate that if there are kids in this neighborhood, this is actually intended to be single story kind of duplex units that are more conducive to empty nesters. Um, but if there are children, our plan is to have the Downs Road serve, serve school bus needs at least. Yeah, and, and, and so maybe just if we're not going to consult school bus, I guess just make sure that, and maybe you already have fire. Fire department is okay with this. Fire department's with comfortable with design. Okay. I agree. I'll, I'll see what others have to say, but I'm not, um, I don't have anything further. Thanks, Robin. Rachel? Yeah, I, I also would like to see what uh, Public Works says about the 75 feet, uh, how comfortable they are with that. Uh, I've got a couple of other things I note here. Thank you very much that you've moved the garage back off of the right of way and you've removed the um, storage room. Right. So that now the garage meets the standards of a maximum of 100 feet, correct? It does. And also, there's landscaping plan between the duplex and the garage. So, if it didn't meet the 100 feet, it would be properly buffered. So, you're Thank you Dolphins for uh, on that one. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a question on the drop-off, the package delivery, and the pedestal. 
um, for the mailboxes, and you've got three parking spaces there. Are they going to be marked as just standing? Or, They're going to be oh. signed that okay. way, and we actually discussed that with Public Works as well as part of the street width discussion and on street parking. So they're going to be signed as um, yeah, parking, short term parking for uh, mail pickup, something more eloquent than that. But yeah. They will be signed. Um, and all of these parking places along the street, if it's a public street, are you going to contemplate making any of them handicapped? Um, we hadn't, but we can look into that. There's, we're meeting our handicap requirements for the units along the Downs Road, um, but we can, we can investigate that further. I, I'm, I'm just thinking that because the trail comes out there, that that might yeah. be access make it a little more accessible if there was a handicapped parking space there. Um, at some point, I thought there was going to be trail connectivity between this lot and the, the uh, uh, multifamily housing. Is that? There was, and we had challenges getting it permitted through Maine DEP under the Natural Resource Protection Act. So we moved away from providing a trail connection over the wetlands and we're relying on the sidewalk along the Downs Road given the wetland impact concerns the state had. Okay. And I followed you on the solar siting about halfway through your explanation. Um, given if, if, if what ends up is the 75 foot radius, does that interrupt? the possibility for solar orientation on the houses or improve it? It improves it. Um, I should have pointed to this plan. So this is, this is the north arrow. So south, the sun comes this way. So this is the southern orientation of the buildings is, is this direction. So these four buildings provide good roof area and solar orientation um, given their layout along the the Downs Road, and these four duplexes do as well with a tighter radius. So if you adjust that radius to 100 feet, that duplex has to pivot about 45 degrees. Um, and in talking to Revision Energy, um, Rocky and his team are figuring out packages where they offer solar on, on potentially all of these and half of the duplexes given their orientation. Um, the nice thing about the duplexes is there's, there's good roof area between the units above the garages that can enable those units to, to generate potentially the, the needs for the needs of each unit from an electricity standpoint. Um, so they want to kind of take advantage of that and, and offer that to, to buyers. So. That's one of the considerations around this phase, but we're also thinking about other phases. So in trying to lay out more of a grid and for a variety of reasons, um, not just solar, but that's, that's a component, uh, again, in this phase and future phases in terms of having tighter corners and, uh, and the like so that buildings don't have to follow long curves and lose their ideal orientation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Rick? Um, sorry. I've got no voice left, so. Uh, I like what you've done with this project. I like most everything about it. And I like the changes that you made um, to help us out. Um, I might as well get right to the radius, because that's what everybody else is asking about. Um, you know what, at 40 feet, I would have just vetoed it. At 75 feet, I'd be more inclined to, to approve it. But the challenge is this. Um, you know, I know we've allowed other projects to have lesser radius in the past, and I like to be fair. But at what point do we start imposing the 100-foot radius? I mean, are we going to have this conversation over and over for the next 300 meetings? We'll be here for 300 meetings, but mm -hmm. at some point, you know, I appreciate the 22-foot radius, I mean, the 22-foot wide street that, that you made for us, and, um, 
you know, at this point, I'd be, I'd like to see what the overall impact of the project is with the 100 foot radius. If it's just tilting that building and losing a little bit of solar, I'm not overly concerned with that, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm more concerned mm -hmm. with the public works being able to get through there without the plow truck scratching a car and the town having to pay for it. You know, whatever else the issue happens to be. I'm not fully versed on what the 100 foot radius gives us over the 75 but my input would be at some point we have to start we have to make a rule and just abide by it and and i and i hate to see i love this project so i hate to see this project be the first person who has to have a 100 foot radius because we allowed other projects to do it six months ago <clears throat> but at some point we at some point we can't have this discussion every week um not with you guys you guys done a great job um so my inclination would be to uh, ask for a 100 foot radius, um, unless it significantly, significantly adverse impacted the feasibility of this project or something, you know? Yeah, if I, if I can comment in terms, we don't want to have this conversation either at the next phase. Right. Uh, and I think a, a big element of this is <laughs> the transition of development design and the transition of public works equipment as well. Um, I don't want to oversimplify it by saying it can just come down to a new piece of equipment, but I think equipment is a big component of this where the town has had a lot of kind of wide streets and more suburban rural development that's occurred historically. And rightly, their equipment is generally geared for that. And as this project builds out and also others that are similar to it. Um, there are, it's a, there's a different design expectation around this project than kind of the, the rules that are in place. So I think that's an element to this conversation where um, we don't want to always be asking for a waiver. We're hoping that, it, that the right design, the right balance is allowed for. And we all collectively now moving forward that X centerline radius is going to work, and it's going to work for the equipment that Public Works either has today or will have in the future. Um, because the zoning right now and the master plans for this project don't match up perfectly with the street acceptance ordinance, and they're both ordinances, and one doesn't necessarily trump the other. Um, it relates to the town's willingness to accept the street. That's the that's the uh, the linchpin there. So. We want to get to the to the right spot as well soon, so that we can design with confidence in the future. And we we also don't want to compromise the first phase because maybe it will take a year or two to get that right piece of equipment. That's all. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm pretty much on the same wavelength as most of my colleagues. Um, I'm. I guess I'm. I'd be cautiously optimistic that you can work uh, with DPW to identify some happy medium, wherever that might be. Um, obviously, going from 35 to 75 is already a, a pretty significant, um, I guess, concession on your part, depending on how one might look at it. Um, although I, I do think it's important for everyone to keep in mind that you know this was originally sort of designed and presented as a private street. So, you know, we're having to sort of go back and, and look at this now, um, you know, with a different set of assumptions. And um, so, you know, going back to the, you know, the building configuration and, and building configurations and so forth, all we're all predicated on this not being a public street. So um, that said, I mean, I think we certainly, I certainly, and I think the board generally um, um, understands that there are some in some cases competing priorities and goals here and that we're trying to do something that is a different type of development that's not kind of prototypical suburban development um, and that's you know that's kind of you know that's a big part of what this is all about obviously uh, as it was at Eastern Village and a couple of the other developments that have been cited um, and I I think it's a it's a point well taken that some of this does have to do with just the, the equipment and infrastructure that's available, and it may be a while before that fleet um, changes over. Um, you know, we're not exactly on a spending spree in town. Um, so 
I, I think you know it's it's one of these cases where we have to uh, we have to we have to find that some kind of a balance between the current the, the, the current reality and the reality that's going to be there for the immediately foreseeable future and, and how things may be down the road, so to speak. So um, I guess I would just come back to saying that uh, I encourage you to to take a look at that, take a closer look along with uh, DPW at the 75 foot option, other options that might be out there that would hopefully enable you to accomplish the other things that you want to accomplish and hopefully with the next, you know, the next time you're here, we can, whatever that is, we lock that in and and you can, can move forward because we, you know, we don't want to drag this out either. I guess the, the final comment I'll make, going back to um, the, the exchange that you and Rick had was that, and, and I, I, I agree with and understand what Rick said about, you know, we, we want to try to be fair and, and but, but one of the things that uh, staff was pointing out earlier is that in a couple of those cases where where they where um, the applicants had been allowed to have smaller radii. Now what's happening is based on these lessons learned, as I understand it anyway, in at least a couple of cases, they're having to go back and actually modify that. So we don't want to have that either. Um, and so I think I think everyone is sort of working toward the same overall goal. And um, again, I'm consciously optimistic that we can find something that something that's sort of a sweet spot. Um, do you have anything else? Uh, I, I have a request that we be allowed to do that as a condition of preliminary subdivision because I don't, I think it's challenging to come back for another preliminary subdivision discussion and then for a final. We'd hope to come to conclusion on the centerline radius between preliminary and final is my, is our request. Yeah, and, and I, and I can understand that. I just and I personally am not really comfortable proceeding on those terms. I mean, I, I think we we came into this meeting based on all the materials that we had, looking at a 35 foot radius, and now we here you can go to 75, which is you know certainly a step in, in the right direction. But we're also hearing from staff that DPW has some issues and may still have some issues. And um, it just seems, I don't know, we, we periodically bump up against this where we, there's sort of this question of how much of a condition is become sort of the tail wagging the dog a little bit. I mean, it seems like kind of a threshold question to me. Um, and I'm not sure how we would even necessarily frame that. It's not, we're not seeking, um, we can't do anything without final. So we'd be coming back for no, final. No, I, <clears throat> I, I understand that and I'm, I'm open to I'm open to input from my fellow board members. I mean, I'm, I'm the chair, but I'm just one vote, and anyone can make a motion. Uh, but, and it, you know, it's, I, I completely understand where you're coming from and what your motivations are. Okay. So I hope you can respect that. And Thank you. Yeah, thanks, we're set. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on, on this, yeah. <clears throat> would it be helpful for us in the future if Public Works, along with the town engineer, came up with some standards for these type of developments? We Is already have We have the standards. We have but, standards. But, but there are cases where the applicants are requesting relief from those standards. Right, I understand, so, but those standards, 100,000 foot radii, that, that's basically, isn't that for primarily all neighborhoods? I mean, I would suggest maybe we can talk about this uh, possibly during planning board comments later, but, you know, okay. perhaps it's a topic for a, for a workshop going forward. So board members will have a better understanding of what goes into those standards and how they might evolve. Okay. But for right now, this is what we have to work with. Next item, number eight, Bluebird Self Storage requests a site plan review for 100 Enterprise Drive, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 4701. No? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is also located in the Higus Parkway zone. Uh, the lot is at the, located at the corner of Route 1 and Enterprise Drive. 
Uh, so the applicant's proposing to build a 103,524 square foot uh, climate controlled self storage facility. Uh, the applicant was last before the board in May. I know they were waiting on some permitting uh, between now and then. Um, they've revised their application in response to comments received at the last uh, board meeting. Since the board's last review, the applicant has eliminated some pavement along the Route 1 side of the building in order to provide it some enhanced landscaping and plantings <laughs> as requested. And finally, the applicant has also enhanced the building's design uh, by replacing some, the majority of the EFIS features with additional windows. And that's what I have for now, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll turn over to the applicant. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm Rick Lundborn from Fuss and O'Neill, a uh, civil engineering firm with me tonight. I have Bill Goodison from uh, Bluebird Self Storage and Brendan I'm sorry, uh, McNamara, who's uh, involved with the architecture of the building. So, um, as Jamel summarized, uh, we're back tonight. We have received all our permits from DEP and uh, also U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because. The Enterprise Drive subdivision had previously disturbed a number of wetlands for the construction of the road, um, and it's such it's also a site location of Development Act project. Um, any further disturbance going down the road or, or forward in time requires a, a more in-depth look when, when you go for a NERPA permit. So it, it becomes a cumulative permit. So for, even though for our site we weren't necessarily disturbing a, a lot of wetlands, in comparison to what had already been done, it added on to that. So that was the need for the federal permit. Um, so we received both the NERPA permit from DEP and the wetlands individual permit that goes with that from the federal government, U.S. Army Corps. And we also have uh, enhanced stormwater permit from the DEP as well. Um, Aside from that, we also had to receive ability to serve letters from the sanitary district and the water district. We have both of those in hand. And um, as Jamel had mentioned, the previous comments, uh, if you look at the screen behind you, I'll just describe or over there. On the left-hand side of the screen or the plan, right where the hand's moving back and forth, there used to be a, a fire access road that we'd put up the side. Um, and it was deemed that the ramp was close enough and it wasn't necessary and it was a means to an end to push that last uh, treatment, stormwater treatment feature closer to the building and enhance the landscaping, as Jamel had said, along uh, the, the Route 1 slip ramp to the um, properties on Enterprise Drive. Um, otherwise, the plan didn't really change much other than the extra landscaping in that shift. Um, with regards to the building and the facade, we did add the windows in, or the, the window treatments in where some of the EFIS treatments were along Enterprise Drive and then I think the end cap facing Route 1. So not, I know you guys have a full house, so not in the interest of not belaboring it, I, I guess I'll just then take questions and we brought building material samples in case you're interested in that stuff as well. You don't think they're here for you? Uh, I, I took a straw poll as they were coming in. I know they're not here for me. <laughs> All right. Um, we do, though, have the opportunity for public comment if there is anyone who would like to speak on this before we go to board discussion. All right. No takers? Any uh, questions from the board? You know what, I don't. I looked through it, I thought it looked good. I tried to come up with some good questions, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing the materials. I wouldn't mind seeing some of the materials, so I think I'm going to let Brendan speak to that since, and then Bill, but I'll help you. Hold it. Yeah, I, I guess maybe I, I, one question I would have is, and maybe this maybe goes along with the materials that you're going to share. When you talk about a window treatment, what exactly is that? Is that you sort of a the elevations in there? Tall the window. That yeah. way, I don't have to. Yep. Yep. Jack Jamel, we'll pull those up. They're at the very end. Yeah. So, previously, do you kind of see between the towers on the ends how the that first panel in the middle on the I guess what is it the east or west elevation? 
there was more of those panels on the the second one in or the first one in from the tower where there is sort of a in, intimated window, but it was an ethos brick treatment. So, but they were alternated down the face of the building. That was requested that that pattern not be so, you know, every other panel. So a lot of those windows got added in. So that was what happened uh, as you went across the long wall there. Adjacent <laughs> to the loading area where no one really sees it other than the patrons, that pretty much did the same. So if you scrolled down, it looked a little more like this before um, along that longer wall that faces Enterprise Drive, and it got swapped out. Yeah, I suspect also um, the understanding of what the windows are when they occur in a blank wall, which is on the, these two examples here. So the only real see-through windows occur on the actual office tower section. So it's in the area where we've added windows in the bulk of the building that they are a form of fake window, but they are the real window with a blanked off section. So that just shows this is the, that's an example of the, a real window. And this is an example of the majority of the windows that you'll see on the building are, they have the blank behind, but they are an actual window. They're just a window to nowhere. That's, that's actually all I wanted to see. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. I wanted to see that one. Can Thank we just have you state your name for the record, please? So uh, Brendan McNamara, I'm the, the designer of the original architectural concept on the building. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Other than that, I like this project. It looks good. Okay, thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I, I guess I, I have one, one question, really, and that is uh, you indicate that there are, uh, what I see, 33 total parking spaces, and I keep counting, and I keep getting to 31 spaces. Um, there are two additional spaces that appear to be there, but they're necessary for turnarounds for the larger trucks. So how can you count them as parking spaces if they're necessary for trucks, fire trucks, other large trucks to have available to turn around? Because there's actually a third space adjacent that would be access to the dumpster that could be utilized by fire trucks larger that's trucks, while there were two other vehicles stored there. That's not the simulation you have. Um, we, the turning, the turning compass shows something a little different. I mean, yeah. it would work is just as well in that location. Though. Uh, CS one oh two. Yeah, I mean. They would still be able to access that. It's just that it'd be a very slight diagonal to scooch over and get into that other spot. And and you know that they can. Uh, I get yeah, a scooch over is a technical term. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're sure that they can scooch over into yeah, that spot? They, they can. They can veer a little bit to get over there and, and use that spot. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. No questions. Thanks, Robin. I I have nothing. Okay. Thank you. Before you keep going, can I just jump in? Sure. Uh, one of the staff comments was about uh, light dimming on the site. And we're, um, we're just sort of wondering at a time that you're proposing for the lights uh, to be dimmed. Is there a time that you would want to have them turn off? They dim down. He said they, they would be set to dim down around 9 o'clock. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else beyond what other board members have said. Um, I'm not generally a huge fan of Windows to Nowhere. Uh, we've had a couple of, <laughs> there have been a couple applications elsewhere in town that you might be aware of that were not terribly successful. Um, but given the nature of this use um, and, the, and the, the way that it's the way that it's designed in this case, uh, I think it'll be fine. And we, you know, we are talking about a self-storage building, and um, I think all things considered, you've done a good job of of uh, addressing prior comments and you know design standards. So um, uh, we do have a draft motion of approval here, which I will put forward. I'm 
you should all have a copy of that now. I move to approve the project titled Bluebird Self Storage, proposed by Bluebird Scarborough LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by CLD Fuss and O'Neill, dated October 15, 2018, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated here, and I won't read those, but those will be part of the record. Um, following conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include a plan notation stating when the lights on the site are proposed to be dimmed. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees, B, coordinate with the fire department in regards to the required third party testing for a BDA system and the required fire hydrant on site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit approval by the Scarborough Sanitary District. Number four, prior to the issuance of a signage permit, the applicant shall revise the identification sign to include the entire street address, 100 Enterprise Drive. Number five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank Good you. Luck. Moving on to item number nine. Stanley Bailey requests a site plan amendment review for 165 Pine Point Road Assessor's Map R68, Lot 6B. Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project, this proposed project, is in the R2 uh, zoning district, uh, the Bailey Seafood Restaurant, uh, located at the corner of Pine Point Road and Old Blue Point Road. Uh, so the applicant's proposing to cut and remove a cluster of trees, uh, remove stumps, grade, and grass seed in area along their southerly and easterly property boundaries, as depicted on the plan on the screen. This portion of land was under a no disturb uh, deed restriction within 25 feet of the neighboring property. However, the applicant has provided a copy of the release of the deeded setback uh, with their application. So the applicant should discuss uh, this with the board tonight. Staff would like to point out that the proposed cleared area is not to be used for seating, cooking, or any other land use uh, related to the restaurant. And finally, the applicant has indicated that the area uh, to be cleared of trees will be graded, but did not provide a grading plan. So staff recommends that a grading <coughs> plan be submitted to ensure appropriate stormwater management on the site. That's it for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Hi. Good evening. My name is Darren White. I'm here on behalf of uh, Stanley Bailey. I'm from Affordable Home Services. Um, I put together all the information that was submitted. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't submit a um, grading plan uh, was because that after the trees are removed and the stumps are removed, we don't plan on changing the grade of the area um, affected. Um, we, can't, we plan on keeping the same grade. Um, just loaming and seeding and uh, straw um, to keep the storm water under control. Um, at the end of the project, we would, um, if required by the town, um, whether it be arborvitaes or the um, enclosed six foot vinyl fencing, um, we were proposing um, through the contractor, the, uh, the contractor that was going to do, be doing the groundwork, um, would be to put a berm of um, bark mulch or chips around the perimeter of the affected area to keep the storm water from going, you know, if we had like a two inch rainstorm, um, it would keep it from coming across onto the other barrier, uh, the other properties. Um, as far as the uh, setback removal, um, Mr. Stan Bailey and April Bailey purchased the abutting property um, in 2018 um, and with the sale of the of the uh, property um, the 25 foot setback that was put in place by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bellevue uh, was removed um, in the contract of the sale um, to Mr. and Mrs. Bailey um, so now we're back to what the town sees fit of 15 foot setback um, Several years ago, the town came in and cut 
10 to 15 trees off the um, old Blue Point Road, old Blue Point Road side of uh, Mr. Bailey's property. Um, they took the pine trees down and, re and replaced um, it with Christmas trees, or I think they're blue screws. I'm not exactly sure what they are. Um, so we're proposing to, um, once the pine trees and the scrub is all cleaned up, uh, we're proposing to either um, continue the, that same type of tree down Oak Blue Point Road to keep a uh, presentable um, appearance to the neighborhood and the people that are living in consideration of the people that are living across the street or maybe arborvitaes or a six foot vinyl fence um, to keep their privacy from the traffic. You know, we're not proposing to put any parking or any buildings on that piece of property at this point in time. Uh, it may be revisited in the future, but not at this point in time. Um, the trees have been overgrown, and with the increase in storms and all that, uh, Mr. Bailey had a 125-foot pine tree fall in his house um, uh, two years ago on St. Patrick's Day, and it's been a constant battle with the insurance company, and they deemed that the repairs needed were X amount of dollars, and um, they were actually, you know, percent quite a bit, 25 percent more than what they uh, what they were what they were wanted to pay so we do not want to revisit anything to do with the insurance companies with the pine trees that are growing and becoming a hazard behind the restaurant um, or the residents next door um, that they purchased okay thank you right. thanks and yeah so I was just uh, you know looking for that permit and acceptance of that so I could continue with the project. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment on this item before we go to board discussion? No? All right. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments on this? The board? No? All right. That yeah, seems pretty straightforward. Um, appreciate the additional background there. Um, we do have a motion here. Corey, um, uh, Mr. Chair, before you uh, read the motion and conditions as written. One of the conditions that staff had prepared was that a grading plan be prepared. Um, I, I think what I heard the applicant say was um, they're not intending, you know, uh, to, to prepare a grading plan. So I think it's just worth a little more discussion just to be sure everyone's clear on what the expectations will be uh, at the, once the trees are cleared, stumped and, and, and stumps are taken away, uh, what the expectations are. Um, in terms of what staff will receive, so I just yeah. yeah I guess the question that I have is how how can we assure how can you assure us then that the existing grade will be maintained after you stump and and uh, you yeah. know grub the area? Um, the only excavation that we'll be doing is removing the stumps, um, so the the majority of the grade will will remain the same. So all we'll be doing is bringing in some. Um, other materials to fill in the divots where they where the stumps are being sure. removed. But short of um, an elevation survey, mm -hmm. how will you ensure to us that 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 grade will be maintained? Because what we're trying to make sure is that you know it doesn't run off to a neighbor and cause issues, or it doesn't run onto the water and cause issues, kind of a thing. So how can you how can you sort of assure us that the that the existing grading will be maintained. What controls can be used on site? Uh, the controls will be uh, will be um, straw putting straw and um, straw and seed down after after the fact that we're going to keep the same grade, and then at the at the end of it, we will be berming the 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 perimeter of the property with the um, with the um, bark mulch. Okay, I guess maybe as, what I, as required uh, or as recommended recommended to me um, through the excavation company that was going to use. I guess what I would I would just maybe suggest is that instead of submitting a grading plan, work with um, staff or present controls to ensure that the current grade will be maintained. Um, Angela, yeah, yeah. I guess um, also looking at I mean you're you're removing the trees and, and so it's also the flow of water exactly. that's going, even if you're going in the same direction. So you can do things, say, like along that property line to kind of protect abutting Control neighbors because it. it looks like it's all kind of heading in one direction. And you can maintain that and maybe it's just, it doesn't need to be a full like engineer grading plan, but it has to have some language that we can go back to a, a site contractor and say, 
here's what the approved plan says, yeah. that you're supposed to kind of maintain that and then maybe do something at that edge so that you're not impacting a butter's yes. yeah, we will be Yeah, uh, we will be doing exactly what you're talking about because uh, Mr. Bailey does own the 165 Pine Point Road, so the abutting neighbor would be himself that owns the ice cream shop next door mm -hmm. and also the two lots that are approved. Um, that we that has a residence and then also another building law. So the only abutting property is directly impacted uh, is owned by the applicant. So if, what I think I'm hearing from this conversation is we might be comfortable with not having a full-on engineered grading plan, but we do want to see some sort of evidence presented and, and maybe looking at condition one, um, some suggested language might be to uh, prior to start of clearing of the site, the applicant shall submit evidence to ensure adequate stormwater management on site to be approved by the planning department staff, that would which be Angela is part of and will be our. <laughs> uh, so, does that make sense to you? Yeah. I, I think yeah. rather than putting anyone else on the spot here, I think that makes more sense to, okay. to move it forward. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. It's a good catch, Jay. Thank you. And thank you, Angela. All right, so with that, I will go ahead and put the motion forward. I move to approve the project titled Site Plan Amendment proposed by Stanley Bailey as depicted on the plan set dated October 5th, 2018 with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated. Conditions, number one, prior to the start of clearing on the site, the applicant shall submit evidence to ensure adequate stormwater management on the site to be approved by planning department staff. Number two, the proposed cleared and graded area is not to be used for seating, cooking, or any other land use related to the restaurant without an approved site plan amendment by the planning board. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chair, I must recuse myself from the last item, so I'll be taking a seat in the in the uh, wings as I am a current member of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. Thank you. Thank you. It's for letting us know. So the final action item is number 10, Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown doing business as Verizon Wireless requests a site plan review for 415 Black Point Road, assessor's map R103, lot 17A. I believe Mr. Chase is going to introduce this one. Sure, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you just know, the applicant is seeking uh, the, the establishment of a new transmission tower in town, and the board has seen this item a couple of times at this point, and so I'll just do a brief uh, overview of the ordinance and then get into staff's comments. So just as a reminder that the, the trans uh, Mission Tower uh, Overlay District and the standards therein are really intended to uh, enable an um, uh, enhanced level of service, uh, telecommunication service in town, but also uh, try to limit the number of cell towers or transmission towers that are required to do so. Um, and in doing that, the uh, town has adopted really sort of a three-step review process. The first step is what we call our priority of location review process, um, which the board spent a good deal of time on and basically found back in September that the applicant has done their due diligence and that, um, that the proposed uh, site and property that's being proposed meets those pr priority location standards. So I'm not going to spend time on, on that matter. Um, the next two steps that we're really here to talk about tonight are then the performance standards around uh, the tower being located at the site. Um, and uh, really provides the planning board with a variety of tools to ensure that there's adequate buffering and, um, and sort of all the other details are, are addressed and those are spelled out in the ordinance. Um, so in our staff review comments, we uh, provided board a number of comments related to those review standards and I will note that I think some of the highlights uh, revolve around the buffering uh, of, the, of the tower and uh, ensuring that there's adequate buffering from sort of all sides. And we've had some visual impact analysis that provide additional information in that regards. 
I think another element um, that staff identified uh, and will at least speak to um, has to do with our style. I think there's some of the um, illustrations that we've seen so far have shown us really both a mono pole, uh, which has sort of the antennas on the exteriors we typically see, as well as a mono pine. Um, and I think there's been some discussion around the, the potential for a, a stealth pole. And so all these are elements that the board can consider as we move forward. Then the final element I'll touch on uh, has to do with co-location. And uh, again, this gets to sort of the overall intent of the ordinance to ensure that if there are towers, that we minimize the number of towers that are required. Um, and so ensuring that it meets the co-location uh, requirements uh, as set forth. Um, as I said, you know, those are sort of the elements that um, I'll highlight here, but we went through the rest of the performance standards and then uh, the board's also to review the proposal in, in light of the site plan review standards as well, the site plan review ordinance standards. A lot of those elements are sort of picked up in a lot of the performance standards uh, from the transportation overlay district, but still uh, a process for, for the board to work through. Um, and finally, before handing it back to you, Mr. Chair, we'll note that we uh, staff has received and, and forwarded to the planning board a host of public comments already um, and those have been as I said forwarded to the board and made as part, part of the public record. And then the final thing I'll say is that uh, we also had modern grid partners on behalf of the planning department review the application as a peer reviewer um, and you will have received their memo as well. With that I'll turn it back to you. Thank you Jay, appreciate that. And I'll just say briefly just to further set the stage that um, I'm not necessarily anticipating that we're going to get to a point this evening where we're um, making any final action, um, but as, as uh, Jay outlined, we've gone through the priority of location process, which this board determined the last time that the applicant was in front of us had satisfied. And so really what I think we should be focusing on this evening as a board is having each member weigh in on those performance standards and see where we land um, by the end of the evening on that to sort of potentially set the stage for, for what, what may happen next. Um, we'll certainly have the opportunity for public comment once the applicant has uh, given, their, given their remarks. And with that, I will hand it over to the applicant's team. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Again, Scott Anderson for Verizon Wireless, and I'm here this evening with uh, Chip Fredette, who does site acquisition for Verizon, um, as well as Keith Valente, who is our radio frequency engineer. They're both here to the extent we get into questions um, uh, that they may be able to address as well. Um, what I'd like to do is on October 15th, we had submitted a kind of summary of our thoughts. Um, because the information has come to you in a couple of different rounds, we tried to put it into a single document of walking through both the site plan review standards as well as the wireless standards. So you have that information, <clears throat> and I'm, uh, I'm not planning on walking through that um, uh, um, uh, one, one piece at a time, but we're here to answer any questions you may have. I did want to hit on a couple of um, uh, one, a couple of new pieces of information as well as a couple of responses to the staff comments, to MGP's comments, and some of the additional materials that just came in before the board meeting. Um, and then we're here for any questions that you may have. Um, first, uh, note, as Jay noted, one of the things that uh, the, the ordinance is focused on is um, back in 2014, I think the town identified and reached three conclusions about this area of town. Uh, the first was there was a coverage gap and an issue in this area of town. Um, the second was there were no existing towers or structures that could be used to install new antennas to address that coverage deficiency. And then this site in particular, the sanitary district site, was identified as one that might be a good candidate for a new tower site. And because of that, the town drew the, the transmission tower overlay district around this area of town, which kind of led Verizon to seek out the sanitary district and, and, and propose to locate a tower at this location. I think a good question that has come up um, both by the board and members of the public, because there's a focus on co-location and when you're dealing with one carrier, you're trying to figure out who might be coming down the pike to make sure, you know, as Jay has noted and the staff have noted in their comments, that we're trying to develop a site here that's going to be a good site, that's going to be able to provide co-location and is going to avoid the risk that 
Sprint or AT&T or other carriers appear in front of you in nine months looking for a brand new tower someplace else in this area. And we have uh, tried to provide some information along those lines, but it's challenging because we don't always know what the other carriers are up to and what they need. Um, but I think we had already indicated that after this process started, um, uh, that we were contacted by Sprint. And the way this works, the carriers, if they think there's a tower either an existing or in the pipeline, will contact the, the, the owner of the tower and say, hey, we'd like to apply to maybe co-locate on your tower. So during this process, we were approached by Sprint. And I think we submitted a letter from them in our um, August 31st submission that uh, noted that Sprint could use the first spot underneath us on the tower. Um, we're proposing a 100-foot tower that puts the middle of our antennas at 96 feet, which is what we call the 96-foot rad center. So we're proposing to go at 96 feet, and Sprint had indicated, and we provided the letter to the board, that they would be able to go at 86 feet, which is 10 feet beneath us. That's the pretty much the standard separation for co-location. I think that the question of the board continued to be, well, what if there's another carrier? Do we have to worry about the tower going up? How do we account for that? How does that compare to the stick? So just recently, actually, after the last meeting in September, we were approached by AT&T, who said that they can use um, the 10-foot section beneath Sprint. So that's the 76 or 78-foot rad center on the tower. Um, we were kind of waiting to, this came to us after we had submitted the last, um, of submission on October 15th, and we were waiting for their site visit, which they had last week, and I guess it went well. So as of right now, even though um, AT&T and Sprint haven't yet filed applications with the town, um, I think what it shows is that the site that we've chosen, the site that was identified by the town back in 2004 as being a particularly good site to try to address the coverage problems in this area of town, has now been picked up on by three carriers. And more importantly, I think, is um, all three carriers are able to use the tower uh, with a cap at 100 feet. So um, neither Sprint nor AT&T were required to go up any higher. Um, both of them can use this site and co-locate on this site, um, going underneath essentially each other, um, uh, obviating the need for having to do any kind of tower extension. So um, we, we totally appreciate that a, a lot of people here still don't like this tower and don't agree with it. But we think that um, given that the goal, uh, I think, of the ordinance and, uh, and of, of this whole process is to try to identify good locations for towers where multiple carriers can go at a relatively low elevation so that we can fix the, the coverage problems but minimize the impacts, I think what we're seeing and what we hope you're seeing is that the other carriers uh, have identified this as a good site too and we're able to um, make, uh, we will be able to make the tower available to two other carriers without having to increase the height of the tower. Um, on the issue of tower style, I think given that there are two additional carriers kind of circling uh, with an interest to co-locate here, it, um, it impacts some of the style considerations. And, um, IDK Communications, who has been working, Ivan's a great guy, we, we, we see him a lot in the state of Maine, he's working with the Prouts Neck folks. Um, he was also, I think as you know, the town's engineer back in 2014 when the town did the new ordinance. He has kind of identified the good news and the bad news about these stealth poles. And by a stealth pole, what um, Ivan is talking about is a, a pole in which the antennas are located on the inside of the pole. So we proposed a, a monopole or a monopine that will have externally mounted antennas. It's a big triangular rack, um, and you can see the antennas. And the suggestion has been, okay, what, what if you put them inside? That would minimize the visual impact of the antennas themselves, and you'll just see the pole. But what Ivan has noted and what we've confirmed is uh, the problem with those, they're called brown sticks or, or, tel uh, or uh, flag poles or, or stealth poles. What happens is when you have a bunch of antennas on a regular pole mounted on the outside, they can all go on the same level. When you put them inside of a stick, the stick is narrower, so what you have to do is you have to stack the antennas on top of each other. So in order to get the same coverage, each carrier has to take two 10-foot sections on the pole, not merely one. And what Ivan had uh, noted, I think it was back in his um, May 30th submission to the board, he noted that you know, the benefit of going with a stick is you, you don't see the antennas, 
but the downside is you have to have a taller tower because in order to get the same coverage, you've got to stack the antennas. Um, as you start adding co-locators to this site, the stick gets more and more difficult to, to work with and at some point becomes impossible to work with. And that's because it's not really meant to handle co-location of multiple carriers. It's meant to be one like it is up at the fire station site, a flagpole that only has US cellular in it. And there's a couple of problems. One, in order to get that stick high enough to put three carriers on, you need six rad centers, each one separated by approximately 10 feet. So that's 60 feet as opposed to only 30 feet of occupied space on a monopole. So the 100-foot monopole or monopine that we've recommended will accommodate co-location on a shorter tower uh, without having to extend it to, to accommodate the three. So the other problem is you've got to run all of the wires for these antennas on the inside of the pole, and they have to all fit. And so if you imagine by the time you get to the, the, the carrier at the top, you've got... Um, for the, when you went, get to the one on the bottom, you've got all of the wires of the co-locators above plus the one, and it becomes very, very difficult to fit all of the wiring equipment inside the pole. As a result, you get a very big pole. So this could be a three or a four foot wide pole at the top. It would also likely have to be 20 or 30 feet taller than the 100 foot pole that we've recommended. And so certainly something to discuss and something to think about, but if what we're trying to do is to provide the lowest possible tower that will accommodate the greatest number of co-locators, co uh, we think the one that we propose is actually the best. Um, the antennas are on the outside, um, but um, the tower is much, much lower. Um, the other design thing to think about is the monopole versus monopine. So we had provided photo sims to the board showing both what a monopole would look like and what a monopine would look like. When you start adding additional carriers, the monopine design works better and better and better. And that's because um, all of the antenna arrays that would be added here um, would be concealed by branches. So in other words, if you're going to have one carrier and one carrier only at the top, you're going to have branches coming down the pole that make it look like a tree. Adding additional carrier antenna arrays into those branches you really doesn't change the visual impact because you're going to see the branches already and it's a good way to hide co-locators um, with externally mounted antennas because the branch system is already there. By doing all of these externally again you can keep the tower height at the 100 feet and you don't have to go up. So uh, this is a, a lot of different ways of saying that if this goes from one carrier trying to fix the coverage to three <laughs> then the, the monopine design with the branches we think not only works well given the sims that you've reviewed, but also will accommodate co-location without any tower extensions and will hide the additional arrays that would be added with the co-locators. Um, let's see. Uh, also, with regard, you're, you're, one of the other issues to discuss that you'll be discussing is buffering. And um, two thoughts on that. As you saw in the simulations, the, 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 the buffering of the tower is really provided by uh, trees that are kind of closer to where the viewers are. So when you looked at those distances of, of you know, two, three, four, five, nine thousand 9,000 feet away, a lot of the trees that are providing buffering are in actually the location of where the viewer is, not on the site. Um, but but the, the question has come up as to whether or not you might be able to shift the location of the tower more to the north, deeper into the forested area on the site, and might that improve the visual impacts from the marsh side? Now, normally, the reason why we chose the location where it's, and Jamal's showing kind of the, the area that has been identified by Ivan as a possible area where you could move the tower into that upper right-hand corner of the lot where there's a tr tremendous amount of vegetation. And that will provide potentially some additional buffering if you're on a boat out in the marsh behind uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, that is the case. The reason why it's located where it is is we try to do the, le the, the least amount of clearing as necessary in order to get the, the site set up and get it kind of tucked in, but not to clear any trees unnecessarily. When you start to go in and clear additional vegetation, it may change the impacts from other directions. And also, as you move through the marsh, what you actually see, and we appreciate that Terry Dewan's shop did one shot where maybe you could see the pole a little bit more than if you moved it to the north. But as you move through the marsh, 
when you move that pole, it kind of adjusts where you're looking and the visual impact may kind of move as you move the pole. So um, it's not clear to us that moving the pole will really improve um, the buffering from any significant number of viewpoints. Um, but we have talked to the sanitary uh, district about that option and they are amenable to thinking about us moving in that direction. So that is an, an option to consider if the board um, kind of moves in that direction. Um, now I do have, and Jamal has queued up, uh, photo simulations. What I did is I culled out of our sims um, the ones that actually just show the monopine. And I want to just run through those really briefly um, um, because we think that that is the best design for this site, um, especially given the interests of two other carriers. The staff have suggested that that may be the best site, although of course they're deferring to you um, in the end um, as to what may work best. And um, with Jamal's assistance, I'm just going to kind of run through these quickly. Each, um, there, was, uh, there were 11 different viewpoints that we had provided you with. Uh, the first one will show a before, and then the next one will show uh, the view of the mono pine. We added a red arrow at the suggestion of staff um, just to, to kind of show you exactly where that mono pine um, is going to be. Um, and I'm Sorry. looking at Jamal, who is um, doing his best to, to help me here, but something is frozen. And so we uh, attempted to kind of give the arrow there so that you could see, because the, the visual impacts from some of these locations um, are very, very minor, and it's hard to see unless it's pointed out. One second. Sorry. We have the wheel of death. We do. <laughs> um, but I can't rush it. So. No, don't rush it. Don't triple click. I know that never works. I'm just trying to see if there's any other comments I should slip in while we're waiting for that. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to comment while we're waiting for that to cure itself is um, we respect and appreciate that we are um, uh, locating a tower on a lot that's right next to the Scarborough Marsh. Um, and we have tried to locate this tower in a way that it will not have an actual impact on any habitat or, or, um, uh, or animals or creatures or birds and the like. We've tried to design the site in conformance with the Fish and Wildlife Guidelines. Um, we appreciate that people may disagree, but we think uh, in choosing a site that's already significantly developed um, in an area where we don't have any actual resource impacts and we've provided that information to you, um, we think this is from an environmental perspective um, is a good site. And, and we don't think you're being presented with a question of whether we should improve cell phone coverage at the expense of the environment and which one is going to win um, in this in, in this um, uh, discussion. We think that they are compatible uses. So in this area um, of Scarborough, you have a very important resource. Uh, you also have a lot of residential development. You've got golf courses. You've got fire stations. You've got a wastewater treatment plant. There's a lot of human development here, too. Um, and what we've tried to do is design a site um, that will not have any adverse impact on that resource. And probably the biggest one is really the impact on the person canoeing in the back or paddling in the back, which is really a kind of a human impact more than an environmental impact. So we think, and we've tried to kind of lay out in our, in our submission on the 15th, why we think that um, uh, as an environmental issue, this is a sound and well-designed site that's not going to harm the marsh or the fish or water quality. There are no discharges. There's no fumes, gas, dust. It's a pretty silent quiet site that just sits there and kicks off a cell phone signal. Um, and as a result, we don't think there'll be any adverse impact um, to uh, that resource. Um, but at the same time, we think we've identified a site that is going to very likely be used by uh, three carriers to significantly address some of those coverage uh, issues in town. So um, um, if what we can do, if you'd like, is we could hold off on the slides, because I know everybody's gone through those sims, um, and we can come back to them, especially if the board has questions when you kind of get to questions about the monopine and what it may look like. Uh, we could queue it up by them. But other than that, those were my uh, thoughts and comments, and um, uh, whatever the, the, the board would like uh, for next steps, uh, please let us know. We're here for questions. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so we are going to um, welcome public comment next. I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, um, I do wish we had more space for folks here. Obviously, this time of the year, 
That other room's not available. I believe they're using that for early voting. Um, so thanks for your patience. Secondly, um, we are going to ask you to please try to keep your comments brief, five minutes tops. There are a lot of people here. We want to be able to hear from, from all of you who want to speak. We have already had a couple of rounds of public comments. We've read all of your correspondence. We saw the full page ad in the paper. Um, we've gone through a very rigorous, thoughtful process here. Um, I will also just reiterate the point that the last time this item was in front of this board, this board determined unanimously that the, um, that the uh, applicant had satisfied the requirements of the priority of location. So I anticipate people will still take issue with that and may have comments about what about this site, what about that site. We are following the ordinance. We went through that process. We had a lot of deliberation. We, got, we had peer review that we looked at and relied upon to an extent. Um, so again, I don't want to tell you what you can or can't say, and we're happy to, to, to listen to you and, and, and factor your, your comments in. But again, our real focus this evening as a board is looking um, beyond the priority of location and looking at these performance standards, and then we can get into some of the, some of the details around buffering and, and so forth. Um, uh, again, just please try to keep your comments brief. Try not to repeat too much, um, and just try to be respectful of, of uh, everyone's time. And uh, also just give your name and address for the record when you come on up. So with that, um, we'll welcome whoever wants to come on up. Okay, well, all right, so if we have the, if we have the, it might be beneficial okay. for the public if we have the ability now to, to go through the visuals, okay. to go ahead and do that. And I'll then, do it real quick okay, we'll, we'll keep it brief and then, the all right, since we have the technical difficulties, we'll go ahead and do that now. All right, Jamel, thanks. Thank so, um, so again, there were 11 um, per perspectives we looked at, and pretty much all of them, you could see it. There were a couple that we skip over because you don't see it. Uh, and basically, the, the, the numbers 1 through 11 start kind of to the northeast of the site. This is a, a view number one. It's the intersection of Spurwink Road and Marion Jordan Road. And then they go kind of counterclockwise around the site. And I can skip through these somewhat quickly. So this is the so-called before. And then as Jamal goes forward, you will see the after that shows the mono pine along with an arrow showing the existence of the pine tree. So that's the visual impact of the mono pine from view one. Look at that, Jamal knew it on the toggling back and forth. That's super helpful. Okay, so then if we go to view number two. This is the end of Strawberry Fields Lane. Again, again, same drill. That's the before, and then Jamal will go to the, the, the after. That shows the monopine added at that site from that viewpoint. Uh, view number three is from the Libby River Bridge. Um, and again, this one, I think you can actually see the crane on the right-hand third of, of the photo, and then when Jamal hits the magic button, it replaces it with the, the monopine. Now, here you can see that the monopine, unlike the other two, is a little more prominent, but when you look at the totality of the vegetation in the view shed, there are a couple of other trees that stick up tall, and that's why we think that at 100 feet, monopine is an issue. You can imagine this at 140, 50, or at 190, which is the, the height of many towers that are trying to come in just under the FAA lighting requirements, and a monopine at, at those elevations would be completely absurd. But when you're working with 100 feet, it's closer to the, to the tree canopy, and it's an option. Um, the next one uh, is number five. This is a CV Landing Road. This is much farther away. It's 9,500 feet, and when you go back and forth, you'll see that the monopine is um, very difficult to see um, on, the, on the horizon in the trees. Uh, the next one is uh, view number six. This is Pine Point Ro Road Bridge over the track. Again, this is very far away, and as he toggles back and forth, you'll see that you, that you, can, you can see it, but you'd really know, uh, have to know what you're looking for, and, and it's very difficult to see. Um, number seven, this is the parking lot at the Fisherman's Co-op. That's about 5,200 feet. And going back and forth, you can see the mono pine as it will look from that perspective over, over on Pine Point. All right, and the next one is view number eight. This is 19 River Sands Drive, a little bit closer. Uh, same thing. You can see the monopine on the horizon there. At these distances, given the, the, the tree coverage, we'll get to view number um, 10 soon. That's when we can see a little more. But 
from these perspectives, it's very, very difficult to see. Okay, view number nine, uh, Jones Creek Drive uh, near the takeout. And if you go back and forth, you'll see the antenna and then the, the monopine added. And then the next one is 10, and we should spend a moment on this. So this is from the backside looking at the sewer uh, sanitary district treatment plant. Um, and uh, in the marsh off to the right was where Terry Dewan shot, had positioned somebody in a boat taking a look at the, at the tower in the back. And as you toggle back and forth, this is the viewpoint at which the, the tower is most visible. Um, it is um, only about 3,400 feet away, so a little more than a half a mile. And certainly when you're on the marsh, you're going to be even closer to the pole. But what we thought was important here is that if this tower gets built and it's up just like that, and this is the first time you come down here and you turn to the left or the right as you're walking your dog or riding your bike and you look over there, you're going to see residential development. You're going to see the uh, sanitary districts treatment plant. So there are significant existing visual impacts there. And you know, I think the question for the board is, how much does that um, tower um, really jump out at you if everything else is there and it's all been constructed and you're all looking at it at the same time? The other thing that's helpful with this view number 10, and it's come up in the staff comments, um, the site that was proposed by the, uh, the, the Prasnack folks was to move that tower essentially to the left uh, in your current view. So it would move a little deeper into the vegetation on the site, um, which may provide some additional uh, vegetative buffering for the bottom half of the tower. So that would kind of further limit the amount of the tower that you can see. Um, you, you can see towers. You need to be able to sort of see them for their antennas to work. Um, but all three carriers have determined that at 100 feet, their, um, uh, their equipment will work and it will fix the, the coverage gap issues here. Um, and this is just another example of how a monopine might be a good fit for this area. The last one is a view number 11. This is kind of coming down south from the fire station site. Again, this is uh, about the same distance, but um, it's a little tighter in the vegetation there, so um, you can see uh, what it will look like as a monopine. Certainly as a monopole in a couple of these um, views, um, you can see uh, that it's a cell phone tower a little bit more, but we think designed as a monopine at this uh, height elevation and given the vegetation, it's a, it's a decent uh, proposal and, and something for your consideration. So thank you for that. Thanks, Ramel. Thank you. I apologize for the uh, little glitch there. I'm glad we were able to get that in. So now uh, we'll welcome public comment. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Whit Wagner. I reside at 10 Bird's Nest Lane in Scarborough. I'm here tonight in my capacity as an individual and as vice president of the Pratt Snack Association. Tonight I'd like to comment on the planning board process regarding the Verizon application for a cell tower at the Sanitary District property on Black Point Road, and comment also on what I perceive to be the planning board's obligation and responsibility to this community. Despite what has been reflected in the record of the 17, September 17th meeting, the planning board did not, in fact, vote on granting priority of location. The four planning board members all commented on the possibility of locating this proposed tower at the Black Point Fire Station and all reflected on the fact that as the ordinance is currently drafted, they felt they had no option but to grant Verizon priority of location of the sanitary district. There, no, there was no vote. The matter was tabled. As members of the planning board, you were appointed by the town council. If you're not satisfied with an ordinance, particularly the way it is drafted, you have an obligation to go back to the town council and seek redress. Ordinances get redrafted all the time. In fact, just recently I received a proposed redraft of the Coastal Waters and Harbors Ordinance. It is with this in mind that the president of the PNA and I wrote a letter to the town council dated October 15th asking that the town council impose a moratorium on new cell towers until such time that the ordinance could be properly drafted. Yes, I'm aware that applications pending prior to, an ordin to a change in an ordinance may still be considered under the old rules. However, a, a moratorium would allow the town to enter into a discussion with Verizon regarding the preferred location and the type and height of the tower. The planning board has used modern grid partners for peer review of technical matters with respect to the proposed tower. You are relying on a firm which by its own admission provides, quote, successful simple system implementations across electric utility industry and related smart grid deployments. Here I quote from the Modern Grid website, 
We are passionate about helping our electric utility customers and the industry embrace emerging technologies, drive value in renewable integration, and embrace new value drivers at utilities. There is nothing on the Modern Grid website about cell towers, telecommunications, evolving technologies for voice and data transmission. You are relying on electric utility consultants to provide this town with input on technical specifications regarding rapidly changing voice and data <coughs> transmission. The town needs an expert in small cell technology and lower height antennas. Let's take the time to get this right before we deface the Scarborough Mars for a generation or more. In fact, in a fact confirmed at the September 17th meeting by Scott Anderson, Council for Verizon, that the proposed cell tower at the Sanitary District will not improve reception or service for the residents of Higgins Beach or Piper Shores. In a letter dated August 14th written by the Town of Scarborough Fire and Police Chiefs, they state that their decision to co-locate on the existing tower at the Black Point Fire Station site was determined by both cost, and here I quote from their letter, our radio vendor recently conducted a propagation study that shows that we can resolve our reception issues in the area by repurposing existing radio equipment from our Pine Point Fire Station to the Black Point Fire Station. Not only will this option be more convenient and less costly than co-locating on the proposed tower at the sanitary district, but the propagation study shows reception will be superior at the Black Point site." End quote. So who's this tower to serve? It's not for the less than 30 year-round residents of Prout's Neck. It's not for the year-round communities of Piper Shores and Higgins Beach or Sandpiper Cove. Nope. The tower is for Verizon's infrastructure. Surely the planning board and the town council do not want to spoil the Scarborough Marsh to benefit just Verizon. It's time the town officials put the citizens of Scarborough first. Veral Dana, as counsel for the applicant, has put forth a response to the planning board in its October 15th submission. I wish to refer to this report as I make a few additional comments. In this letter to the planning board, counsel states that, quote, our approach as supported by Verizon Wireless has been to approve coverage in Maine communities based on three guiding principles. In the third principle, counsel states, quote, if we need to propose a new tower, we identify sites with criteria that will minimize the impact of a new tower and we use siting criteria that will allow us to significantly improve coverage while minimizing the impact of the new towers. Well, Verizon has, in the case of the proposed sanitary district, achieved neither of these objectives. They are not significantly improving service, and they're not minimizing the impact. On page three of the Verrill Dana submission under the heading Compliance with Applicable Standards, Council has the temerity to state, although the property is located adjacent to the Scarborough Marsh, which is certainly a unique and important natural feature. The footprint of the proposed tower is dramatically smaller than the footprint of the existing treatment facility. Are we to be considered buffoons? Our opposition is not about the footprint, it's about the visual impact. For the record, let me remind Mr. Anderson that a tower is a tall structure, taller than it is wide, often by a significant margin. So where do we go from here? The common sense approach would involve three simple steps. First, a moratorium on, a new cell, on new cell tower construction. Second, the planning board hiring a firm skilled in matters related to voice and data transmission. And third, the redrafting of an ordinance that reflects the realities of 2018 technology. That, ladies and gentlemen, the planning board is your civic obligation. Hiding behind a poorly drafted ordinance and defacing the Scarborough Marsh is not exercising your duties to this community. But I'm a realist. I sense you will choose to move down the simpler route and approve a tower at the sanitary district. If you do so, please insist the tower be limited to less than 100 feet, and that it be a stealth tower with concealed antennas, an ugly monopine or a monopole with an array of ugly microwave antennas may be suitable for the main turnpike, but not for the Scarborough Marsh. I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your service to this town. Thank you. Please, I'm going to ask that people not, that we not do that after, after we, we need to just sort of keep things moving. I'm going Thank to you. take far less time because we very well summed up what I wanted to share. Um, my name is Catherine Wise. I have a residence at, on Ferry Road in Scarborough. 
I think that Attorney Anderson has jumped the gun because he's discussing the kind of poll he's going to be putting up. He has not met the two um, issues that Jay so ably presented today, which have to do with enhancing communication and limiting the number of towers. As you stated in the last meeting, the tower will not serve Higgins Beach. I've also spoken with people, and I was at Piper Shores today, and that is also an area that will not receive improved communication, nor will Pleasant Hill. So therefore, the first component that they must meet will not be met. The second one is limiting the number of towers. So if they build one tower that is going to serve a very limited number of people, what does that mean will happen next year or the following year? They will either come and ask to add an addition onto that tower, or they will come forward to you and ask to build another tower. So again, I would, would, we would reiterate what Witt said was, Last time when there were members of the council missing, I believe that there were three members missing, this was put on, this was tabled, um, and so therefore you did not vote to move forward. I would ask you all to revisit the ordinance. I would again reemphasize the idea of putting on a moratorium and make sure that Verizon meets the enhanced communication <coughs> and meets the limiting of uh, towers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucy LaCase at uh, 52 Old Neck Road, and I emailed Jamel a couple photos. If you want to put that first one up, that'd be great, Jamel. Thank you. So here we are again discussing Verizon's application to install a large cellular transmission tower in the edge of the Scarborough Marsh, the largest salt marsh in the state and a resource that has tremendous significant value to Scarborough residents, as evidenced by the summary of results in Scarborough's recent comprehensive plan survey. In that survey, which was just published at the end, or the results which was just published at the end of September, 81.37% of respondents agreed with the strategy to, quote, preserve elements of the town's rural character and significant vis vis vistas. Choices of answers were agree, maybe agree, disagree, no opinion. 86.4% of respondents agreed to, quote, protect the Scarborough Marsh's ecosystem through the preservation of watercourses and undeveloped blocks of land that are significant to wildlife habitat and low-impact recreation opportunities, like paddling in the marsh. These two statements represent the highest percentages of agreement out of all the questions in the survey. Fiscal sustainability came in third at only 68.44%. Protecting the Scarborough Marsh appears to be about the only thing that our town can agree upon. Listen to your constituents. We are Scarborough residents, and we are speaking to you. And we are also part of the environment. 86.4% of us place tremendous value on the Scarborough Marsh for wildlife and recreation. And 81.3% of us want to preserve Scarborough's significant vistas. That unified voice of Scarborough residents should not be ignored. Additionally, we need to acknowledge the unspoken voices of the 20,000 people who visit Maine Audubon's Nature Center each year and the 88,000 people who annually enjoy the Eastern Trail as it crosses the marsh. I got those numbers from Maine Audubon. A monopine tower would be an abomination on the landscape, hulking above the trees at the marsh's edge. Any tower, especially those with an external antennae arrays, would desecrate that viewshed, sullying one of Scarborough's most significant vistas. In their own words, Verizon acknowledges that those antennae arrays cannot be buffered if they are to work. Quote, they must be seen in order to operate. And let's not forget that these array arrays are really big, with each set being approximately seven feet tall by 11 feet wide. And a question I have of um, the council is these other carriers, presumably their antennae can't be buffered either for them to operate, which says something about why they're choosing this site. Oh, Jamal, can you go back to the other picture, please? That one. 
thank you. Um, lack of buttering, buffering is a hugely serious issue here. Verizon states that it only has control over the 75 foot square area which they are leasing and which will be cleared. Verizon claims that existing vegetation over which they have no control will provide adequate buffering for their tower. This is not true. There is not adequate buffering at this location. As stated in the zoning ordinance, and I'm quoting, within the transmission tower overlay district, all transmission towers shall be surrounded by a buffer of dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impact from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. The Scarborough Marsh is a widely used and highly valued public space, and there is no buffer of dense tree growth or vegetation to screen the proposed tower from that prized public space. The Car Scarborough Marsh is our town's most important public space, and it would not be screened from the tower at the proposed location. This photo was taken in, um, on October 19th of 2018 from the vicinity of Old Neck Road, looking across the public, to the public, across the public space, that is the Scarborough Marsh, to the sanitary district property. The sanitary district buildings are slightly barely visible in that area between the two, these two pines and that pine. Um, hardly representing, quote, a significant existing visual impact as claimed by Verizon. Verizon's tower would be in front of these two trees and between, right in front and between these two tallest, tallest trees. Highly visible and rising above the pines as evidenced in the next photo. Okay, Jamal, now you can do this next one, please. Go, go back to the first one? Yes, yeah, sorry, I had them yeah. backwards then. Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. No worries. Okay, this one. So this picture was taken from across the marsh last spring, and it's of Verizon's crane when it comes back up. Okay, there's the crane, um, as you can, with a balloon floating at a, supposedly a, at 100 feet. As you can see, most of this crane is not buffered by dense tree growth and vegetation, and the crane is almost entirely exposed and visible to the large public space that is the Scarborough Marsh. Now imagine this large, this unbuffered crane and balloon as an unbuffered 100-foot tower with its large unbuffered antennae arrays. And now imagine that crane as an unbuffered 120 or 130-foot tower. In Modern Grid Partners Review of Verizon's resubmitted documents, they stated that the visual impacts of towers with a height of 120 or 130 feet are legally relevant and within the planning board's purview. It's a real possibility that that's going to go up higher. Verizon claims in their submittal package of October 15, 2018, that, quote, buffering of the, and you refer to this, buffering of the tower from locations off-site is provided by vegetation near the viewer or vegetation located some distance between the tower and the viewer and not by the existing vegetation on the sanitary district property. They're admitting to no buffering. And as evidence in this these photos, that is absolutely and unequivocally not the case from the perspective of any viewer who is recreating on or digging clams in or simply admiring the view across that amazing public space that is the Scarborough Marsh. As our town leaders, the burden's on you to follow the zoning ordinance and to do the right thing. Given the proposed tower's lack of buffering from Scarborough's most prized public space, Verizon's application should absolutely be denied for that location. Perhaps there's another better buffered location within the sanitary district property. I don't know. The planning board should consider a site visit and should ask for somebody to analyze additional locations. By the way, I don't buy Verizon's rather patronizing Dunkin' Donuts comment that the planning board shouldn't be proposing alternatives in their responses in their latest documents. So whereas the lack of compliance for buffering is clearly grounds to deny this application, there are some other issues that should also be brought to light that have been referenced, but I'm going to go into a little further detail. Verizon's stated need for this tower is to address deficient coverage in the area around Prout's Neck. As we've learned, it will have nothing to do to help um, other Scarborough residents like Higgins Beach or Piper Shores. Verizon needs to be honest about their real purpose for this tower. This tower isn't really about Scarborough and the coverage needs of Scarborough residents. 
If it were, Verizon would locate the air tower in an area that would serve more people than 30 or so year-round residents at Prout's Neck. Verizon really wants this tower to provide capacity relief for their towers in the towns of Old Orchard and Saco. And yet, that is not stated anywhere in Verizon's resubmitted 25-page document. In fact, in those materials, Verizon references coverage 18 times and capacity not at all. This is in significant contrast to Verizon's initial 18-page radio frequency report of January 23, 2018, in which capacity is referenced 20 times. On page 8 of that radio frequency report, there is a capacity offload summary table, table 2, which tabulates the amount of capacity that would be offloaded from three different cell towers by Verizon's proposed cell tower on the sanitary district property. If you combine the total number of residential and employee POPs offloaded, 56.33% of provided capacity relief would be for the Old Orchard Tower, 103 would be for the Saco Tower, and 33% for the Scarborough's Black Point Church Steeple Tower. In other words, 66.63% of this tower's capacity relief would be for sectors outside of Scarborough. And Verizon is not even talking about this. They are purposefully avoiding the topic of capacity. Why should Scarborough have to carry the burden of inadequate capacities in Old Orchard Beach and Saco? As I stated before, before, Verizon needs to be honest about their real purpose for this tower. This tower isn't about coverage needs for Scarborough residents. It's about bolstering capacity in Old Orchard and Saco. Lastly, I don't know if the fire station is a viable alternative. I hope so. But I do discount Verizon's claim that, quote, from the perspective of migrating birds, there is simply no difference between the fire station and the sanitary district sites. Nearly all the birds that utilize the marsh for foraging during migration or nesting season are shorebirds, wading birds, and terns that travel back and forth between the Scarborough Marsh and Stratton and Bluff Islands, one and a half miles south of Prout's Neck. With no mammalian predators and such close proximity to the highly productive feeding grounds of the Scarborough Marsh, these islands are a premier pre location for safe nesting during breeding season and safe roosting during migration. They are owned and managed by the National Audubon Society and are a registered important bird area, as is the Scarborough Marsh. We're talking about thousands of birds that fly either out of the Scarborough River across or across that narrow isthmus of land that happens to be the sanitary district property to return to Stratton and Bluff. Simply put, these water birds are not flying inland past the fire station. So hopefully you are planners are coming to realize that there are numerous flaw, flaws and inconsistencies with Verizon's application documents, that Verizon is being deceptive about the fundamental purpose for this tower, and that there is a complete lack of compliance with Scarborough's o zoning ordinance standard for buffering within the transmission tower overlay district as written on page 9 and section 9 of the zoning ordinance. This tower would represent an unbuffered industrial edifice whose primary function would be to serve Old Orchard Beach from the edge of our town's most valued public space and one of its most prized vistas, the highly valued Scarborough Marsh. This tower would not be surrounded by a buffer of dense tree growth, as shown there, and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impact from this iconic public space that is the Scarborough Marsh. Verizon's application for a wireless telecommunications facility at their proposed location should absolutely be denied on the grounds of inadequate buffering. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, please, I, please. I just, could I just I, in the interest and, and in respect of everyone's time, I, I really ask you to please try to keep your comments to five minutes. I don't want to cut anyone off. There are a lot of people here who I, I assume still want to speak. We're all here listening. Um, but if we can try to keep the comments to five minutes and try to avoid the applause after the comments, that would be helpful and sort of keep things moving along with all due respect. We really want to hear you, but I, I just ask that you please try to try to cooperate with that. Thank you. Two and a half pages, double space. Thank you. 14 point. My name's Steve Panette. I reside at 16 Goldman Drive in Scarborough. I'm a board and vice president for the Friends of Scarborough Marsh, and I'm here to my testimony to um, oppose the application. Um, 
Verizon's asking you to judge a project in the interests of technological progress and customer service, and I ask you to reject it for similar but different reasons. Um, I'll start with customer service. As Lucy mentioned, well over 80% 80 of the respondents to this um, surveys for the comprehensive plan um, identified um, that they want to protect the marsh ecosystem and that they want to preserve the town's character and significant vistas. This would appear to indicate that um, the marsh is important to the essence of life in Scarborough, whether for beauty, rivers for paddling, or wildness. The marsh is one place where you can still lose yourself, and I emphasize lose, from civilization, where you can search for things and feelings that live outside our notions of the modern world. It provides a service to the town's citizens. Therefore, the marsh's very existence in its current state, without a tower, is a customer service to the citizens, a resource that contributes to Scarborough's identity, along with its beaches, the rock that cliff, cliff walk, and rural character. We don't have a downtown, but we have these. If you blight the view shed of the marsh with a cell tower, you will diminish this customer service. On a technological progress perspective, given the new technologies that bombard us daily, it seems realistic to believe that this isn't the only feasible location for this tower, regardless of what the planning board and the town council did in the past, identifying this location. Um, it would seem feasible that there are other locations that could accomplish the capacity relief that Verizon desires. And does new technology exist that would make this proposed tower unnecessary or a different location acceptable? It would seem to me, um, I mean, I, we don't know. I certainly don't know as a, a layman what's out there, but certainly you folks do. One that has less visual and ecological impact than the one being proposed. What if the current proposed tower location didn't exist? What if it was 50 years from now and sea level rise took the maximum <coughs> trend possible and this site was underwater? Where would we go then? We'd have to select another location. What would Verizon do then? Appeal to other technology solutions, select an alternative location, maybe a lower profile tower with a distributed antenna system or a sim similar technology in multiple locations. They wouldn't just disregard the customer needs, which is what they are asking you to do for us tonight, but to us tonight. Verizon tells us that they've explored all options and they don't solve the coverage capacity problems, but this proposed location is the only one that does the trick. But we really don't know all the details of the alternatives. They may or may not have evaluated and why they were rejected. But we do know one thing. The tower will be an industrial blight on the southern half of Scarborough Mar Marsh, Crowd's Neck, and Pine Point. We, the citizens, will have our relationships with that part of the marsh irrevocably changed if this tower is approved. We don't live here because of the unsightly development that has occurred along parts of Route 1 over the early years or for our non-existent downtown. We live here for the natural beauty, the Scarborough way of life, and the quality of our schools. Please don't change that tonight or in the future. I urge you to reject this application. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marvin Gates. I live at 423 Black Point Road. Um, I've been uh, the liaison person in the organized group who's dealt with Ivan Pagasik, a uh, gentleman <coughs> you're very well aware of. Ivan's been difficult to reach in the last uh, few weeks. He suddenly lost his wife at age 55. For all of us who have ever, and I'm not that close to Ivan, worked with him, when he was up here in the, at the June meeting, uh, I didn't. I said, my wife and I would love to have you stay. You've come a long way. No, he went home. And when you read about his wife, it didn't really matter where he was, however late he was at night, uh, he went home. She was that kind of person. Uh, Ivan did submit a letter. He submitted a letter on uh, Friday. Uh, 
Jamel and Jay were at a conference, uh, and he at, and therefore it wasn't published in your uh, Dropbox file. Uh, he asked me to read it, and uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. It's brief. We 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 do have a copy of it. It wasn't in, it wasn't in the initial package, but we were given a copy of it earlier this week. But feel free to cite it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the other thing, in, in talking with uh, Ivan briefly last week and going over the, uh, uh, the October 15th submittal letter from uh, Farrell Dana and uh, Verizon, of course, he was struck uh, by how many opinions Verizon listed in their letter unsubstantiated. The one that is the most striking to him was that uh, Verizon is stating that Sprint can co-locate beneath them. And now they're stating, of course, that AT&T can co-locate beneath Sprint. Um, there's no RF report. That's, I respect Verizon's opinion, but it's as good without substantiation as my saying they can't. And uh, obviously, there's an obligation that you have to uh, have the RF data to substantiate such a claim. Otherwise, as all of you know, MGP's report, their memo uh, about that letter uh, uh, of the 15th by Verizon, that you are obligated or otherwise should question, and your attorney should, uh, Verizon's claim that you can only consider a 100-foot tower. Uh, MGP stated clearly you should consider a 120 and 130 foot tower for reasons having to do with federal law, I think. That's why there's a 130 foot tower up here. For some of us, we're thinking that way. And MGP supported that. I'd also like to read Jay's, uh, Ivan's letter very quickly because uh, I noted that in their letter, they referenced Ivan, I counted 24 times, and that you've heard them reference him tonight. IDK Communications has been asked by the Protzenek Association to review the application by Verizon Wireless to install a telecommunications facility on the sanitary district property located at 415 Black Point Road. As you are aware, IDK prepared the wireless antenna site assessment for the town on April 26, 2014. Part of that assessment included the analysis and the subsequent recommendation of locations for a telecommunications facility, including at the sanitary district. Also in its report, IDK recommended, quote, the town may wish to specify as well the type of structure for each location, end quote. The option of stealth installations where the antennas installed within the pole was referenced. The town adopted the recommendation in the town's ordinance under section 9F2E tower style, where it specifically states, quote, stealth towers exhibiting concealed antennas. To that end, and with Verizon's confirmation of its guiding principles, as stated in its letter dated October 15, 2018, quote, if we need to propose a new tower, we identify sites with criteria that will minimize the impact of the new tower and other siting criteria that will allow us to significantly improve coverage while minimizing the impacts of new towers. IDK offers the following recommendations to the board. There was an end quote in there. Number one, identify agreed upon distant locations around the proposed site to evaluate the overall visual impacts and effects of the proposed monopine versus a 120 foot monopole with antennas concealed internally. That, what that means, I had to ask him, is that he, you know, rather than say from here or from there or from there, actually identify sites that are of value where you would say, here's the view from this point, here's the view from this point, and this is what the monopine looks like, and this is what the uh, stealth tower with the antennas on the inside looks like, and show us. Show yourselves. Compare it. In order to properly perform this, the first step would be to finalize the location of the structure on the lot. The board may wish to walk the site with the applicant and the town's consultant to determine this location. Once the visual impact analysis is complete, 
the board will have the opportunity to weigh the pros and cons for each style of installation. While no installation may be perfect at this location, by performing this due diligence, the determination of minimal impact can be determined. This will align with both the applicant's desire for minimizing impact, as stated in their letter, and the board's confirmation of a complete weighing of options, which is identified in the ordinance. I appreciate your time, and I'm available to answer any questions you or the board may have. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm from Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry. And as you may recall, I'm here representing the Prout's Neck Association. I wanted to focus on uh, provisions in the ordinance, since that is what this board must apply in reviewing this application. Under Section 9, subsection F2E, this board, and this board alone, is authorized to determine whether a monopole a monopine, as is proposed, or a stealth tower, quote, exhibiting concealed antennas is the appropriate choice for any proposed location. The monopine tower that's proposed falls within the camouflaging treatment section of that provision. The stealth tower with concealed antennas, you've heard tonight, is referred to as a brown stick, it's referred to as a flagpole, it is the only tower type that makes sense in this particular location. We have shown you photo simulations of the internally mounted tower. There's one right next to me right now at a higher height than is proposed. Um, Verizon has shown you simulations of the monopine, but it has limited those simulations to 100 feet. Um, they, are, they are not as clear as the simulations that we showed you of the, uh, of the stealth pole and of the regular monopole. Um, and we would, we would ask that you, you require Verizon to pro provide you a better simulation, as has previously been stated. You identify the locations that you want it from, and we need to see higher proposals for the monopine for reasons that I'm going to discuss in a couple of minutes. Um, has, as Lucy has discussed, she had a photo of the crane up there. It is very clear from the photo of the crane that the top of a 100-foot tower is going to be very visible above the tree line. It has to be visible above the tree line or the tower doesn't work. But because it's visible above the tree line, the treatment of that tower becomes essential for this board. And something that is, uh, that is a, an external array, whether it's camouflaged or not, is much more visually impactful than the brown stick, which is a straight pole that goes up and will be, will be painted. This board can require uh, specific paint treatment under the provisions of the ordinance to make it less visible. We would ask that you, you require Verizon to present a proposal to you that meets that specific requirement to make this less <coughs> visually intrusive than what has been proposed. The planning board cannot conduct its full review until it has all of this information. It has some of it, but as has been noted, you have pictures from various locations of various quality, and it's, it, it's probably difficult for this board to put those pictures together and get a good sense of what things are. I think that uh, Terry Dewan, our, our consultant, has done a good job with the things that it has done, but those may not be the locations that this board cares most about. We think that some of them are, and you may want other ones. Um, the town's peer reviewer, Modern Grid Partners, in its most recent report, stated that it believed that the consideration of the visual impact of a tower at 120 or 130 feet is legally relevant to your review. That's for a couple of reasons. The first is that your ordinance allows a tower even taller than that. And so to say that, well, we know that three providers uh, we know that Verizon can go in at 100 or 96, and Sprint has said it believes it can go in under that, and um, someone else has come in and said they think they can go under that. That's fine, but that's not all the providers in the universe. There may be other providers, and if they come in, or if one of those providers suddenly decides, you know what, we're not going to get sufficient coverage, we've done more tests on this, we need to go higher, 
they're going to want to go higher. So you need to be looking at higher towers than 100 feet because that may not be where this ends up being at the end of the review. Pro at the end of your review process, it may be there. In a few years, it may be something else. We hope that the board will deny the application based upon its failure to meet required standards in the ordinance. However, if this board feels that it has to approve some tower at this location, please exercise your authority under Section 9FE to require a stealth tower with concealed antennas and not the visually intrusive monopine uh, proposed by Verizon in its most recent application. The visual impact of the sanitary district in this area is not relevant. That building, those buildings have been there for many, many years. And more importantly, they are not subject to the same requirements as a new uh, telecommunications transmission tower in the overlay district. Second, I'm, I won't spend quite as much time on this as I was going to because I think Lucy did a really good job of talking about the requirements in the ordinance um, concerning buffering requirements. Uh, for, these are set forth in section 9F2C subsection 2 of the ordinance. Um, as she noted, this requires a buffer of dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impact from abutting properties, roadways, and as she noted, and public spaces. In this case, uh, I think the board has recognized that the uh, least dense buffer on this entire site is that which it should be the densest one, and that's the one that abuts the marsh. To the extent that Verizon is relying upon existing vegetation on other parts of the sanitary district property or, or property or, or vegetation from other properties, that's not what the ordinance requires. The ordinance requires that it be on the sanitation district property, not that it be buffered from other locations from, or from other properties. Um, but also note that under the ordinance, this board has the authority to require that a landscape easement be developed prohibiting the removal or topping of trees in the buffer area, except for dead or dying trees. The landscape buffer can be up to 150% of the tower height and can include buffering and vegetation outside of the carrier's lease area. I think that this is something that is really crucial if the board is going to approve a tower in this location, particularly in the buffer adjoining the marsh. The 150, the entire 150 foot buffer area should be subject to this type of easement so that there is a restriction that these trees not be able to be removed. Um, there aren't enough trees there as it is. The ones that are there should not be allowed to be removed for any reason. And I think that what you've heard from Verizon is it only controls what's in its lease area. Um, they certainly can revise their lease with the sanitary district to get the necessary easement. We, we would ask the board seriously consider requiring such an easement due to the sensitivity of this area. Uh, at the last meeting um, and in a, its presentation tonight, Verizon's Council has referred to statements made by Ivan Pagasic. You all know who Ivan is. You know he's doing some work for us. You know he's done work for the town in the past. Uh, there's no question that Ivan was one of the people who uh, developed the locations, and this was one of the locations that he proposed. But I think what's really important to note is that Ivan was not hired to, nor did he make recommendations about what type of tower was appropriate in any specific location. In fact, this board is charged with that under the provisions of the ordinance. So you're not going to see anywhere in these various studies about uh, the areas of town that need additional location, what kind of tower is going to be proposed, how high that tower is going to be, uh, what kind of buffering is going to be required, because all of that is on this board to determine. No one but this board gets to make that decision, and no one has made any recommendations in prior studies as to those issues. Finally, I know that the board uh, discussed priority of location, and everyone expressed their opinion about this. I do think that there is, there is one thing that the board has not, um, has not really considered and may feel that it shouldn't consider, but there is provision in federal law. It's set forth in 47 
USC section 1455 subsection A. This provision allows for the modification of an existing tower as long as it does not substantially change the physical dimension of the tower. The FCC issued a ruling in 2014, which is found in FCC opinion 14-153 paragraph 188, that determined that a substantial change to a tower is the greater of 20 feet or 10% of the existing tower height. So for the fire station, it would be 20 feet. It's really important to note that the Spectrum Act states that a municipality cannot deny and has to approve this type of modification to an existing tower. So if someone comes in and they want to go on the fire station tower, they show that it can be, that it needs to be at a higher height uh, for their coverage, and provides the suitable engineering, they can go on the existing tower and this board can't say no. The same thing is going to be true on the sanitary district parcel once Verizon goes in at any specific height. If the ordinance were to change in the future and you said, you know, in retrospect, we don't want tall towers next to this, well, that 100-foot tower that they're proposing can go up to 120 feet. And so that brings me back to where I was at the beginning about the importance of having a visual impact study done that shows towers at different heights, keeping in mind that federal law may, apply, may allow somebody to go in here at 120 feet if you approve 110, or sorry, 100, without further review by this board. Or if there is review by this board, you can't say no to it if they show they need to be at that height. So I think Verizon would say, well, that's not what we're asking for. And, you know, that's kind of fair, except that the nature of this use is very different from other things that you see in that federal law requires that co-location occur before new towers go up. And so this allows people to do some shortcuts around things that would normally apply in your ordinance. So we would ask, and we really strongly urge this board to keep all of that in mind as you move forward to think about the fact that what's 100 feet today can easily go to 120 feet with minimal additional review uh, regardless of what this board wants to do. You can't place a condition of approval that limits it to 100 feet. You're not allowed to do that under federal law. So we urge you, this board is the last protection of this site um, and the last protection concerning the design of a tower if one goes here and we ask that you think strongly about what the ordinance allows you to do, that you require additional visual simulation so that you can make a, a well-informed decision. And once again, we urge you, if you are going to approve something here, to approve a stealth tower with internal antennas. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Turfloth, Two Sanctuary Lane, <clears throat> Scarborough. A uh, somewhat different tack uh, to start out with anyways. You've heard it, some of you haven't here, but the interesting point about this evening is that this audience is far larger than just this room. Although I'm talking to you, hi, and he's gone, but there's interest, extreme interest in this at a level way beyond merely the us chumps here in town, given the amount of attention that we don't appear to be getting um, in being heard, because it's not seeming to come through based on our prior hearings here um, until now. So there's this that you've seen, which is an interesting piece uh, that you all probably read in the Scarborough Leader. If you haven't, number one paper in Scarborough. Um, there's an ad that was taken out and it puts forth a pretty, pretty good argument of, on the position regarding the tower. Never mind who sponsored it. It's a lot, if not most of the facts that you've heard tonight uh, and you've been hearing. The next is one that hasn't been referred to, but it's this op-ed piece in Maine's biggest paper. This is what's taking this issue beyond this room 
beyond this town and beyond the state. This is something that is written, Town of Scarborough's Verizon, can you hear us now? <laughs> so this piece actually refers in good depth. It's extremely well written. It's an op-ed. And it basically says that um, the tower will be a blight to the marsh and uh, that there's plenty that needs to be done. So with that, Verizon, are you listening yet? Can you hear us now? In the op-ed, the largest paper in the state has now elevated the issue to a whole new level, reaching beyond the town. The Scarborough leader has now also put this fiasco right up front. With the op-ed, uh, now people are taking notice. And I ask, in the case that those who are watching who might be related, Angus King, can we count on your help to put Verizon and its 130-foot, potentially, tower in its proper place? I watched a gubernatorial debate last night, and there's another later this week. Perhaps a short take question ought to be posed in that forum on statewide TV. Something like, 86% of Scarborough's population place the environment, specifically the marsh, its beauty and its wildlife is the number one asset of the town. Should big business and big money be allowed to push aside the will of its population by being permitted to build a cell tower in Maine's largest and most important marsh? At another level, to what extent can we trust the information that's being put forth by Verl and Verizon? Lots of examples have been given. With its expert advice, we hear um, all kinds of reasons that Dana and Verizon couch uh, their arguments over a litany of documents, fact-finding papers and presentations. Few examples demonstrating the spirit with which it's submitted. The technicalities have been put out tonight, but a few others just of interest. In its memo to the Town of Scarborough mm -hmm. Planning Board in a 15-minute a 15-page missive uh, dated October 15th, the one we've referred to. The project will not be located near wetlands, nor water bodies, or other unique natural features. Really? This, the Scarborough um, Sanitary District is an artificial line that's been drawn into the natural marsh. So if you want to hide behind the technicality of whether or not it's in the marsh, good point. It's not in the marsh. Is it in the marsh? I think we all know the answer to that. End of story. Anyhow, good spot, Verrill. On number eight of the doc, page number eight of the document sent by Verrill, they claim that the planning board voted to confirm, confirm Verizon's proposed 100-foot tower. There was no vote. I was here. I heard. There was discussion. And I don't know how that can find its way into a document that is starting to look official. And then for the board to say that they've passed it. There's no vote. Then um, Modern Grid Partners in memo dated October 22nd, we've referred to that before. Town of Scarborough respectfully suggests that Verrill Horizons uh, written word contains a few anomalies. They go on to say that a certain part is inaccurate and suggest a town council review. Well, that's as good as being called out on a Sunday afternoon NFL play and, uh, and uh, losing your time out. Uh, the, um, they go on to say, uh, Modern Grid, that a certain part of the um, missive is inaccurate and suggest a town council review. Then. There's a collocation co section, F2G, that does not reflect the section accurately where the board is indeed able to require different tower height. That's all been gone through again. Again, they suggest a town council review. Can the town, its planning board, or anybody else take Verrill's and Verizon's word without worrying how they've been parsed, calculated, and um, placed in such a manipulative way? 
I would have expected a higher standard of plain spoken truth from one of Maine's leading law firms. With the foundation being laid out this year for strategic plan to defy the town's future over multiple year horizon, we've learned about the huge buy-in around the theme of nature conservancy. conservancy. While on the one hand, the town encouraged the fullest possible participation and got it, on the other, it seems to dismiss that will. The town planning board seems to take refuge in the wording of the ordinance with what more than one member last meeting called unfortunate wording, wording that was construed to support by elimination of options the building of the abomination in the marsh. At the last hearing, a few members lamented that if the wording was just a little different, it could actually cause the current fire station tower to be rebuilt, thereby eliminating the problem, improving the service for Higgins Beach, Remember the fire station flagpole improvement was ruled out by Verizon because of low height and space limitations. The rewording of the ordinance, space could be made available, the tower could be rebuilt properly, and remember that it stands on much higher ground than the marsh. So while we like to refer to feet in terms of height, the relevant point is actually perspective uh, from the top of the tower the height of a tower at the fire station is actually going to be a much lower tower than the tower in the marsh to achieve the same effect over a horizon. <coughs> so nature's marsh or the town council's tower, maybe that's what we could call it. Please listen. Obviously it's the political season. In a few short days, town and country are being asked to vote on a number of critical matters. These are now defining moments for many who have staked their public and personal reputations on stances taken while in office. Now the community is watching <clears throat> and expecting to be heard and to witness what this town and state will do about this issue that's far bigger than the few communities around the marsh. It's about good governance and accountability at town hall and well beyond. It's about honesty and transparency it's not about committing past mistakes, and it is about doing the right thing. Thanks for your time. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brad Willauer, <clears throat> excuse me, and I live at uh, 8 Sanctuary Lane in Scarborough. Before moving here 29 years ago, I was elect chairman of the planning board in the town of Dedham, Massachusetts. And I chaired it the whole five years I was there. There we achieved the best results when the applicant and the planning board worked in an open and collaborative manner. <clears throat> citizen input to us, as it is to you, was paramount. And zoning ordinance gave us some latitude, as it does you. Although I wasn't able to be at the last meeting because I was away out of state on business, I haven't seen much collaboration in this process. What do I mean by that? Well, as we've heard, you've heard, a group of citizens have hired at their own expense cell tower experts to suggest to the planning board to give you assistance on other locations within the zoning ordinance. And you've heard much about that tonight. So I don't need to go into it anymore. To my disbelief, however, I've learned that Verizon, to the contrary, through their attorneys at Beryl and Dana, have taken exception to every single one of the professional comments and suggestions and disagreed with all our professional's advice. Look, this may seem like rocket science, but it isn't. There's absolutely, absolutely no sense in invading the Scarborough Marsh with anything such as this. None. 
Everybody in this room knows that Verizon has the ability to locate proper towers in, elsewhere in Scarborough or in other towns. You have, the, you have within Scarborough's ordinance the, the, the ability to deliver. Uh, I'm sorry, they have the ability to deliver fine service wherever they want to put it. But they need not locate. They need not locate. They need not locate this where the citizenry of this town will be very, very upset forever. Now, I'll close by giving maybe a suggestion to you as one chairman to another. Ask this person to withdraw his application. Ask him to come and meet with you. Find, it's been suggested that the ordinance needs fixing. I'm not privy to whether that's, wh where that goes. But time out, take time, so that no mistake such as this happens. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, my name is Suzanne Foley-Ferguson, and I live at 331 Black Point Road. <clears throat> And I'm first going to apologize because I sort of came late to the, to the game in terms of <clears throat> following through on what has been going on. I went to go visit the site with the balloon in the spring, the day that it was too windy, I guess. And then I broke my leg, and it was a real severe thing. So I wasn't able to follow. I had a really bad, uh, really bad summer. So anyway, if I say something that's incorrect, I, would, I don't mind you coming up and telling me I'm, I'm wrong in saying it. I hope that some of the people that spoke today and said that um, you hadn't finished the priority of location because you hadn't taken a vote, I hope that's true. If it's true, then my, my, opinion, my, um, my statements might be more helpful. If it's not true, if you've already passed that point, it might not um, be. First, I'm going to ask three questions that I don't expect the answers for, but I didn't hear here, and maybe they were answered before. Are, is the tower going to be lit up, and what is the visual at night for that? Number two, what's the visual from Ferry Beach and Western Beach and in a kayak? Um, well, we saw some, some from certain neighborhoods, but um, we didn't see that, so those are some questions. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out in terms, everybody keeps saying, you know, is there an alternative way? And they keep talking about the fire station. <clears throat> in 2014, I was a, <clears throat> formed the group that opposed the overlay districts for the entire town. <clears throat> As a result of that, we have a Facebook group called Scarborough Families for the Responsible Siting of Cell Towers. At that point, we pushed for locating all cell towers in industrial parks. And the reason we did that is because we know about the health concerns. Although this board, your board, can't deal with those, and neither can the town council, the, the health effects of cell towers are real. And the Black Point Tower is in a residential neighborhood right near my house. So when you look at options, just remember that in the back of your mind. I'm not saying I prefer the sanitary district location as opposed to the fire, but I am, <laughs> mostly because of the proximity to my house. <clears throat> However, we fought to um, eliminate the overlay district and some, and we've got, we got a little bit of ways, um, but we didn't get it to the point where it was all in industrial park, um, industrial arrows. But I learned a lot because I was involved in the smart meter cases and all of the RF, um, information that has to do with cell towers and smart meters. It all, they kind of all flow together. They're a little bit different here and there. But you learn a lot just by doing these processes at the state level. And what I learned is that some of these towers can run 22 to 45 miles as, as far as they reach. 22 to 45 miles. Now, that depends upon geography, ups and downs, hills, trees, buildings, etc. cetera. Um, that would put any of our industrial, well, that would put the Pleasant Hill Industrial Park, which there is, a, there is a tower over there in South Portland, 
that would put that in the 22, that would put in the, in the miles that it would reach. I found interesting that um, what Lucy said about the 66% of it really has to do with the capacity needs for Verizon. From my personal perspective, I will say this. I have Verizon. I live at 33, 331 Black Point Road. There's a dead zone when you drive by my house when people are trying to call me. But in my house, never do I have a failing call, ever. Um, I still have a landline, and I don't like cell phones that much, but I still use them. But I also have neighbors that have AT&T, and they do have some cell problems, and I've heard some people say that. But at what expense? And so here's what we're talking about. At what expense to the environment? At what expense to health, to our culture? At what expense? Um, for me, it's a no-brainer. Um, put them in industrial parks where they belong. As a matter of fact, especially if they can be placed there instead. So I'm going to go back then, and I'll finish up um, the priority of location. If you haven't finished it yet, the questions I have are, did Verizon satisfy the planning board with alternatives? In other words, did you guys look at alternatives? Did, or did they just say, oh, yeah, we've looked at alternatives, and, and then you just trusted it? Or did you actually see that they looked at the fire station, and at the fire station we can't raise it, at that, or at the Pleasant Hill, or there's nobody at the Pleasant Hill Industrial Park that will sell us or rent us a space at the industrial park. Or, you know, I, I don't know if you saw alternatives or not, because I haven't been paying attention. I'm sorry. Maybe you have. But it seems to me when, I, when the ordinance was adopted, they, they had to first say, is coverage needed? So I wanted to know what evidence did the applicant provide of a need? Was it, um, you know, 500 people can't get cell coverage? Was it there's 85,000 dropped calls? Um, when I go online and I look at Verizon cell coverage, mm -hmm. it looks like it's covered beautifully. If you go down um, Highland Avenue, by satellite radio from um, in my Prius, conks out for a, a period of time. That's satellite, <laughs> and it conks out because sometimes you just can't reach certain spots. You're going to have dead zones no matter what. <clears throat> Sounds like Higgins Beach might have some dead spots. I don't know. Or maybe... Piper Shores has some dead spots. I don't know. But if that's the case, it seems that looking at that industrial park over Pleasant Hill would be a great spot, too. So anyway, what evidence did the applicant provide of, or, um, of the need? Because I think what when you guys have to say priority of location, I think you have to decide, is the, is the applicant providing the evidence of need? And also, is the tower going to, to actually uh, fulfill that need? Or is it going to fulfill the need over in OOB? So those are two things I, I would assume that you guys, maybe you already talked about. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I had to say, but I did want to encourage people. I understand the role of the planning board, and they have to follow the ordinance, and I totally get that. All of you people who are speaking, I believe, need to talk to the town council and the ordinance, and it is true that the planning board could probably say, hey, this ordinance stinks, send it back, and we already have an applicant. But in 2014, we fought uh, real hard about this, and we, um, we were at the polls and everything, getting signatures and everything. Um, so you got to definitely be proactive about it because, of, um, because federal law um, basically covers this in what they've got, what you guys got to do. So I respect what you've got to do. But if you do have to go back, those are some of the questions I think you should answer um, if you did table it and you have to vote again. I think that's, I think that's all I have. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Bill Case. I also live at 52 Old Neck Road. I'm married to Lucy. Uh, I'm going to be very focused. I'm not going to go through my three pages of comments. And in fact, I'll make a, a great concession to start. Um, I'll adopt everything Lucy said, and I'll stay in public that she's smarter than I am, and she's more <laughs> articulate. Okay, And I say that because I love both Lucy and the Marsh so much. 
I don't remember a vote on the priority of, loca priority of location, but whether you feel you voted or not, it was really clear at the last meeting that you all felt that you were put in a box by an ordinance that you did not think was adequate. I think every board member that was here expressed concerns about placing a tower where Verizon wants to place it, but you felt that you just didn't have any choice. We're in a different place now because we're talking about another part of the ordinance. Uh, when Lucy was up, she read um, the buffering ordinance, and I just want to go back to that. And again, the ordinance reads, within the transmission tower overlay district, all transmission towers shall be surrounded by a buffer of dense tree growth and vegetation that screens the facility and minimizes its visual impact from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces. At the last meeting, Chairman, you mentioned the fact that there's a tower on Scott o Hill. You mentioned the sanitary district buildings. You mentioned the train. And I'm not sure if you were referring to how that impacts the buffering section, because we were talking about something else then. But I think it's important to comment on the fact that there are no exceptions in this buffering section if there is a tower someplace else. There's not an exception for the fact that there's a train that runs through the marsh. And there's not an exception because there are low buildings at the sanitary district. In fact, I think this buffering section recognizes the fact that even our most pristine place in Scarborough, which is the marsh, is going to already have some development on it that occurred prior to Rachel, Rachel Carson showing up and prior to us being smarter about what we put on the marsh. So instead of the fact that there is already some industrial edifices on the marsh weakening the buffeting section, I think it actually strengthens it. And I think it's really clear in reading this that the purpose of this is to not allow additional degradation of the marsh area. So I think it's just very important that we are aware of that. So I don't think it matters that the, the tower on Scotto Hill. In fact, it's more important that we don't have another tower that makes the, the marsh situation worse. At the last meeting, you also talked about the fact that you spent a lot of time fishing on the marsh. I do too, and off the record, someday I want to know your favorite places. But the fact is, as a fisherman, we have a very unique perspective of what you can see when you're on the marsh, because it's flat. And I can't conceive of any way, based on the proposal that we have today, that this can be adequately buffered based on the language in the ordinance. Maybe when we were talking about the priority of location, the ordinance isn't as effective as it ought to be. And I think you were all feeling that you were put in a difficult position <coughs> by the town council. You had to follow what the ordinance is. But I don't think with this buffering ordinance, we can blame somebody else. This is on us, and it's especially on us, if the proposal doesn't meet this ordinance. We can't walk away and say, oh, only if the town council had done something else. This ordinance allows you to say no to this proposal. And I think it's very important that we don't leave here blaming somebody else. Whatever we do here, whether we can convince you or not, is what our children and their children are going to be looking at. And I think this buffering language was designed to preserve the marsh as it is without this ugly cell tower that's being proposed changing what we're trying to leave our children. So. That's it. I wanted to just focus on that one issue. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ron Bono, 6 Old Neck Road. I'll be brief because I know we'd all rather be watching the Patriots tonight than being here. Uh, the, uh, prior to the current 20, uh, uh, 2014 uh, ordinance uh, revisions to cell towers that are currently in effect that created these overlay zones. Um, U.S. Cellular applied uh, for a tower at the fire station on Black Point Road. I was involved with it at that time because uh, a lot of the local uh, folks weren't very uh, happy with that application. Their application was for a 100-foot tower in that location. So for some reason, U.S. Cellular, Cellular felt that a 100-foot tower, perhaps even more, uh, was doable in that location. So that was their application if you look back uh, on uh, U.S. Cellular's uh, uh, request. 
They made that application, long story short, to sweeten the pot to get approval because at that time cell towers were not allowed in residential areas, but it was town-owned property, so that was an exception to the rule. So consequently, and also to sweeten the pot, U.S. Cellular gave the town approximately $100,000 of equipment uh, to get the approval done. So it, long story short, it was approved, but to satisfy residents, this board uh, um, ended up uh, approving 80 feet. And currently that tower is 80 feet tall, but was proposed at 100 feet. So I think that's important information to know. Fast forward to 2014, somebody mentioned about um, the town council uh, looking at revising the cell tower uh, locations in the town. And again, prior to that, you couldn't have cell towers in residential areas. A lot of folks uh, spoke against that uh, uh, proposal or that ordinance change. We had dozens of people speaking against it. We had, we had um, petitions that were signed. Hundreds of people in town signed the petitions of those that might have been around in 2014 regarding this. And what there was only one person that publicly in all the meetings that took place before this ordinance, there's only one person that spoke uh, in favor of these overlay zones and changing this, these, uh, the ordinances. And that was a representative from AT&T. <laughs> so here we are, fast forward to 2018, we're in the same position where we have all these folks here spending their time meeting after meeting, speaking against having this location, this overlay location uh, by the marsh. And one person that we are aware of that has spoken in favor of this, um, this uh, proposal, and that's Verizon. So I, I think we have to consider the people locally in Scarborough that, it, that we've had a problem in town, I've lived in town most of my adult life, we've had issues with, with the town not hearing, so it seems, what people are saying, locals are saying, saying regarding these kinds of issues. And again, I've sent several letters to the planning uh, uh, <coughs> staff requesting that we look at other possibilities. It's clear by some of what's been said this evening that a lot of the uh, reasons that uh, Verizon is requesting this location has very little to do with cell service uh, in Prout's Neck. And as we know, now we're hearing that um, uh, AT&T and Sprint want to locate. I'd like to know how many cell phones there are in Prout's Neck. It seems like every Pr Prout's Neck resident would have 50 cell phones in order to make it financially viable for Verizon to put a tower in that location to provide coverage in that location. <coughs> Several of my letters to the board have talked about the fact that when the 2014 ordinance was changed, they now allow 250 foot towers in industrial zones in town. They never did prior to 2014. There's one on, on Pleasant Hill Road industrial zone that should allow a 250 foot tower. There's also an overlay zone by the old Orchard Beach Sockle Line, which we've heard about this evening that will allow up to a 150 foot tower that is away from the marsh. I don't understand why this board has not looked into it and, and considered these other alternatives, either through some engineering study or whatever, but, but to just basically say, according to the uh, modern grid partners, that uh, we've looked at the Black Point Inn cupola, the church steeple, and the fire station, and uh, I should feel confident that Verizon has appropriately addressed this. And that's basically it. I don't think that's covered enough possibilities in town to keep the cell tower proposal off the marsh. And I will end with that comment. And I'd appreciate your consideration of other locations. Is there anyone else waiting outside or? Okay. Well, as always, we appreciate the comments and the feedback. Thank you for coming and, and for waiting and for your thoughtful <coughs> comments. Um, the applicant can have an opportunity to respond to some of the comments and, and questions that were, that were put out there. Um, through the course of the, the board discussion. 
I do want to make clear, and, and it's because it's come up before, you know, once we've closed public comment for the evening, that's it for public comment, and that's not to try to be rude or anything. It's just that it, it just doesn't work to have a lot of back and forth. So um, we will do our best to address your questions and comments through the board in discussion with the applicant. Um, and please be assured that we've, we've heard you and we've, in, we've incorporated all of that in, into our deliberations. Um, Nick, do you have any? Uh, Two in a row, I see. Yeah. <laughs> You're approving leadoff hitter, so. All right, well, again, I'll uh, echo Troy's comments. Thank you all for coming out this evening. And, um, you know, it's not easy to, not everyone has, uh, well, apparently this crowd doesn't have a problem with it, but public speaking. Um, great job, guys. <laughs> so <laughs> some people get real nervous when they have to talk in front of cameras and people. So, um, I, you know, I do appreciate, somebody probably had to work up the courage to do that. So I, I appreciate you um, showing up here tonight to give us your feedback. Um, I'm going to tell you um, something that's even harder to do. And it's this job sometimes. Um, because it, I have to put a, aside my personal feelings to uphold an ordinance. If I don't uphold an ordinance, why show up here? <coughs> why have applications? Why go through these packets? Why, have, why pass ordinances? We don't hold them up. What are we doing here? Which ones can we throw out? Which one can, do we want it all to be by individual personalities? How we feel about a project? This and the other thing. We do need to uphold that. Now, that said, um, we have flexibility. We do have some ability to use um, our brains and interpret. Um, but I do want to take this time to address one comment in particular, and, and I, I think it was a little bit unfair to every member here of this board. We are five volunteers, as you clearly can see, and we show up here, and we do the best we can, and we are, we are tasked with one simple thing, and, it, and it's that oath to uphold our ordinances. We don't get a chance to um, write them. We don't get a chance to typically vote on them. These are things that happen outside of it. We do get feedback, and I actually, if anyone is here, the, Started the night sauce, basically give some feedback on on some information, and at the end, Corey goes, "Okay, well, we can't vote on it or do anything, but hopefully they're listening." Sometimes that's what it feels like to be up here. Is we see, we get to see a lot, we get to see a lot of the details, we get a lot of information from a multiple sources, including you, the audience. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we have our own personal opinions, um, but they can't always come into play. So I'm going to lead up with that. I think it was um, there was one criticism out there saying that um, you know that we have some sort of duty to the constituency here, and they and it was indicated that this is all laid at our feet. And it's not. There was multiple points in this process, um, as really Ms. Foley Ferguson said. Those zoning overlay districts somehow. They got a district, a zoning district, located straight up on the marsh. Like, we were all sleeping on this one, I think. You know, and um, yes, clearly there were some that were not. Um, but um, <coughs> you know, there's there's plenty of blame to go around, and it's not all on the five people you see here volunteering tonight. And I just want to be that clear as we go through this process that we too care. You know, we do have personal uh, opinions about this issue in particular. I am going to do my best now after my soapbox uh, speech to stick to some of the, the items that we came here to talk about tonight. Um, buffering, let's start with buffering. Um, you know, it sounds to me based on the documents you submitted that you felt that the natural buffer was the best you were going to get. Um, and if that's not my, if I'm not interpreting your language correctly, please correct me. Um, that you plan on sticking with the natural vegetation as your buffer? Yeah, I mean, I think the, when you're thinking of buffering, you're, you're looking at two different issues. You're looking at um, how would you buffer the equipment installation at the base of a tower, and then the second question is how do you try to buffer the tower itself? So um, we, uh, what we have uh, uh, proposed is that there is natural vegetation on site that um, we've already start, started to t talk to the sanitary district about possibly moving um, the, 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 the tower location deeper into the existing vegetation because there is quite a bit right there. I don't get the sense that anybody is talking about buffering of the fence or of the backup generator or of these uh, equipment boxes. Um, the comments that I'm hearing are 
how can we buffer the, the tower and how do we do that? And I, the point that we've made is that um, if you're in a boat in the back of the marsh and you're looking out at the back, this view shed 10 and the one that Terry Dewan shop has done, then the vegetation that is on site is playing a role in buffering that tower. And we've talked to the sanitary district and it may make sense to move that tower to the north, deeper into the, into the woods, which would pro provide additional buffering from that one position in the marsh. We continue to assert, however, that when you are at all of those other places that we were talking about, looking at, that it's not the trees within 10, 20, or 30 feet of that tower that are buffering the views from those other locations, 1 through 11. Those, when you're on Pine Point and you're in these different locations, there's, there's tree uh, uh, vegetation that is where the, where the viewer is and, and off the lot entirely where we're located. So, now, you may, folks may dig into this stuff and say, well, from here, I think it's this, and here, I think it's there, and, and, and that's appropriate, and we want to get you whatever information you think you need so you can make these buffering decisions. Um, but, you know, other than moving that tower a little bit to the north to provide some further buffering from the marsh, um, I mean, you can't plant 65-foot trees. You can't do anything that will actually block... Um, the views of the tower and we think when you look at the visual simulation and you look at the areas that were driven as part of the simulation to see where the tower could be visible at 100 feet and then you see what happens when you add the monopine um, um, self fixture to it ultimately it's all of your call as to whether or not the visual impacts are minimized to a sufficient degree and buffered to a certain degree um, but we think that from most places in this entire area you're not going to be able to see the tower. You're not going to know it's there. And if we can provide some additional buffering by relocating the tower within the site um, so that from the marsh, and when you're out there in a boat, you, you can see less of it, we're, we're happy to, to talk about that. Yeah, I think that's where you need to end up. I think if, if this is the location that is ultimately determined and it's going to be here, buffering isn't just, I know it's, we're all focusing maybe on the top of the tree right now, Maybe some of us are focusing on I kayak and fish through there every day, and what I see is the bottom of this thing. I, I think the buffering is it's in, in its entirety, mm -hmm. and it's of the equipment. I don't want to get that lost uh, in this mix either, which is it's not just the pole. There's equipment there and other things that do need attention. So if um, you know if you don't believe you have the adequate space here, because I know it's been alluded to, you only own 75 feet of, if you don't have the adequate space to buffer. <coughs> I'm going to tell you right now that I'm going to consider the buffer in, incomplete. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you, you should probably consider that strongly as you go forward. Yeah, um, and, we're, and we're here. I mean, this is the first time we've really started to get into the standards. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, I'm, I'm listening to everything, both the public comment and what the, the, what the sense and the questions and the concerns are from board members um, on the buffering piece. And we are, you know, I, 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 we have tried to be straightforward with the board about what we need and why we're here. We participated back in 2014, tried to provide information that would help the town to make some of these decisions about how to fix an ordinance that was illegal in 2013. There's no question about it. And we offered lots of ideas, and the town went through a very significant process. Ivan Pajacek, who is the Prout's next expert, was the town's expert. And that was not a loose process where he kicked around some ideas. He assessed where there were coverage problems. He looked at where the existing towers were. He identified areas that couldn't be served. And Ivan, in his 2014 report, said directly to the town council, no one else can use the Black Point Fire Station tower. It's too short. There's not enough space. That wasn't our opinion. That was Ivan's opinion when he worked for you. And I don't know about MGP, you know, I, I haven't worked with them a lot, but Ivan is the go-to person for municipalities in Maine reviewing Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile sites, and he was your expert. And so there was this whole process that identified not just capacity offloads for Old Orchard Beach, that is not the purpose of the site, but coverage problems. And there is unquestionably a coverage gap in here. Again, Ivan's concluded, conclusion in 2014. 
the sanitary district site, the site that he pointed to as the place that somebody like Verizon should go to address this issue. And now AT&T and Sprint are jumping on board, and obviously we can get the board information on what they need and why they're coming here. But we have responded to the determinations made by the town with Ivan and have picked the site that was deemed most appropriate. Now, in this area of town, you're going to be able to see a tower from the marsh. Somewhere in the marsh, you can't fix this coverage gap. So we appreciate that you know, on this site, we want to look at existing vegetation. We want to look at the option of moving it. We, want to, we are obviously going to talk to the sanitary district about can we get any rights outside of our lease area. I, I, you'd be, I, I'd be crazy if I thought I'm leaving this room today without going back and talking to them about that. Now, we don't want to interfere with their expansion. We don't want to screw up their operations. But we are going to talk to them about location and about buffering on the site, and we'll continue to do that. I think that kind of bigger, and maybe this is more than in response to your question, but we disagree with a lot of the RF issues. We've got a lot of questions here about the ordinance itself. There have been questions raised about the town attorney arcing in on whether you can look at speculative future impacts and the like. So we want to be responsive, and we have tried to be direct and honest with you in this process. We are going to listen and do whatever we can to try to make whatever changes that the board feels would be helpful to minimize the impacts of this site. But I just don't want it to pass that we are where we are on this site because it was determined to be the best location or one of the best locations to fix a problem shared by multiple carriers and in a way that could be respectful and responsive and balance all these competing things. So I mean, I think it's a good ordinance. We didn't get everything we wanted. We, we don't have um, a, a service in any residential areas, which is a major problem for small cells. And, you know, we didn't like the 25 acres. There were, there were a lot of things that the town basically told us, <laughs> thanks, but, but no thanks. So we're just trying to work within that framework, and we'll continue to do it going forward. And so we're here to listen, you know, to, listen to your thoughts and concerns. I promise not to give that long of an answer to each and every question, but I just wanted to hit some of kind of the big topics that had come up, and um, so I apologize, Nick. I so uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that I think there were a couple good points brought up about, um, well, personally, visually, I think the monopine at 100 feet, really from distances, it, I, you know, it's hard to tell. I, I mean, that's just straight up how I feel about it. Um, but. I do believe that we have a due diligence to look at what a monopine looks like from those vantage points. Um, and I believe there was word of a, what was it called, the stick? Stealth. 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 Stealth tower. What do those visually look like from distances with buffering, with if you select a new location on the site? I think there's more that we should be looking at. Yeah, the best, the best thing I think, Terry Dewan's group did a simulation of the 120-foot stick and they also did it, which I think the gentleman had on the color slides earlier, and also showed what that 120-foot stick would look like if you moved it to the north. So I think the board has a couple of sims we do have for that alternative. Correct. I, but I think we need, um, I would like to see a complete comparison side by side, because those, that information came, I believe, and I could be wrong, from the public. Is that? that from yeah, the press. Yeah. yeah. Just, if I could just jump in for a second, I, sure. I think what, what you're asking for, which I... I, th I think I would also like to see is sort of a, a full compilation of sort of apples to apples, oranges to oranges, bananas to bananas, you know, that different types at different heights from the same vantage points. Yeah. Um, because we have, it, it's, been, it's been sort of a little bit piecemeal to this point. So, mm -hmm. sorry, Nick. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm after. And, and, the, and the fact is, that, look, the irony is not lost to me here that if we had... Uh, requested, and I say we, I don't, I don't know if I was on the board at this point, or any of us were on this board at this point, but if, if there was a requirement or a request that that U.S. cellular tower in the, black, you know, in, the, in the firehouse was built with a foundation that could accommodate expansion and a tower that was expandable, we wouldn't even be here tonight. But I hear from 75% of this audience that we can't let it go over 100 feet, and I'm like, oh, look, this is how we end up in places like this. I think it should be expandable. And if that's the case, I want to see what it looks like at 150 feet. Isn't that the tallest it can go? I mean, I mean, if we're really talking about doing this, I mean, 150 feet is as high as you can go with this, right? 
No, it's not. So um, 100, I mean, there, there's a couple layers to that. First, the factual layer, and I think Natalie Burns had flagged this. Um, the only way, if, we, if you were to approve a 100-foot tower here, and when we do the apples and apples, remember, we're going to have to show 120 foot thick, not 100 mm -hmm. foot tower. But if you approve a 100 foot tower here, the only way it could go up is either someone came under the Spectrum Act, which was the 42 at USC. There, there are rights under federal law um, when someone has built a tower and it's been deemed to work well, what Congress decided was too many towns were preventing co-location. So we're going to kind of streamline co-location. So you can do uh, essentially a 20-foot increase on top of any approved tower as a matter of right under federal law, but that's it. So there's absolutely no way for this tower to go to 130 feet, 40, or 50, um, unless the planning board were to approve that increase. So, um, so that's the factual piece. The legal piece, and there's been a number of references to the town attorney, and this might be a parallel track for you to look at. Um, you know, looking at the visual impacts of a tower at 120 feet assumes that someone is going to come down and actually do that. And as a board, you're not allowed to look at what might happen in the future that's speculative in trying to figure out what the impacts would be of something that's actually proposed to you. So um, the comment was made about all the carriers circling around. There are really five in Maine. There's Verizon, Sprint, and AT&T, who have all indicated they can go on this tower all below, at or below 100 feet. US Cell is already on the fire station, which leaves T-Mobile. So there's only one more carrier left that's uh, like operating and, and constructing its own network in Maine. And so theoretically, T-Mobile could come in and find that they couldn't use the fire station, and they would have to do this and do a 20-foot extension. That is conceivable, but we have no idea whether that happens tomorrow, next week, next month, or never. And so I think you would want to get some input from the town attorney on, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, what your ordinance provides is that if you concluded that this tower that we're proposing is useless unless it's 120 feet, you might be able to order us to go to 20, 120 feet. That's a little bit pushing it, but I think legally you could do that. But what you can't do is say, look, maybe 10 years from now somebody comes down and puts 20 feet on top of that, so we're going to look at 120 feet now and make a decision about whether or not that the visual impacts are, um, are appropriate. Uh, that would be worth running by the town attorney because well, I don't have, think you I'm can do that. Stop you right there. We have the authority to ask you for an expandable tower, right? Yes. And we have the definitely authority do to make that. you build a foundation put one on. Yep, absolutely. So why wouldn't I want to know what it looks like at 120 feet? Because it may never go to 120 feet. You're right. But if I'm going to ask for all that equipment, I want to know what it looks like. And I don't think that's hard to think and ask. No, no, I no, we can... A we can with, with a, a monopine at 120 is a big ask. No, you're right. And we can show you a monopine at 120 feet. All right. Sizing the foundation, I've got that. I need... This is not what's... All right. I got a lot of notes. I'm going to kick it off to Roger for a minute because I need. I'm going to take five, not to be rude, but I, I need five. Let me just uh, ask you a, a question uh, pertaining to what Nick was just sure. asking. Say we allow you to go to 120 feet. Now, the federal law says that somebody else in the future can come in and go to 140. Go to 140. That's right. Okay. So you don't want to do that. Right, okay. I just wanted to clarify Especially that. if the applicant before you doesn't need 120 feet. Um, yeah. And, you know, the thing with Sprint and at t is a little weird because they haven't filed anything with you, and that's kind of speculative, too. But we have just been responding to kind of questions from the board as to, okay, if you build it at 100, is that going to be adequate for co-location? So we've tried to collect this un other information from these other carriers about what they might need, and they've indicated that they could go beneath us. But... You're right. That 20 feet on top of whatever you approve would be what the federal law would permit. Okay. Um, Nick covered the buffering. I, I just want to kind of explore a little bit more on the um, on the capacity versus the coverage, mm -hmm. right? And the enhanced benefit that this is supposed to bring to that area. Um, are we talking um, technical um, benefits for, say, the cell phone companies versus the users, for instance, uh, what I'm getting at is we've already um, established that the coverage is not going to benefit, you know, Piper Shores or Higgins Beach. I'm not sure. I don't recall wh whether there was any discussion about what kind of coverage gets down to Pine Point. I assume there's going to be coverage down there. How far does it extend down there? 
Well, we had provided in our initial. talking about a regular user now. Yeah, so everything that happens with a network is for the benefit of the people using their cell phones. Um, the, 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 no, no Verizon, AT&T has some sort of independent corporate uh, 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 need. It's about providing better coverage because they're all in competition with customers and they want to have networks that work. And so, um, you know, ultimately, yes, the, the company is profited by having lots of customers, but that's because they do a network that works for the customers. So any site that is coming in where you've got existing towers, and remember, we have gone um, and are providing coverage in the bulk of Scarborough with only one new tower, and that's the Carter Rowland site that we did with this port a while ago. We've gone on existing towers. We've gone on um, in the church steeple where no one knew it was even there, even your own consulting engineer. And then coverage in Scarborough is being provided by Old Orchard Beach, by Cape Elizabeth, by Saco, by towers that exist in those towns. Residents of Scarborough benefit from signals from those towers. Whenever you come in and you've identified a deficient area, it's deficient for two reasons. One, because the coverage is crummy. And the, reason, and the second reason is when you're in that bad coverage area and your phone is trying to operate, it's starting to reach to all of these other towers in Saco and Old Orchard Beach and Cape Elizabeth and trying to use them and it fails, but that process hurts the operation of the other, um, of the other sites. So the same thing for the Carter site or the church steeple site. If you know, we're in there and people are, you know, these are new sites that we've, we've built in, but they're not part of a network that works together, those sites don't work either. So sites like this that come in and fill holes like this are doing two things. They're providing coverage and we have stated repeatedly that there's a coverage problem here and that this is meeting a coverage need. Ivan identified this as an area of coverage need for the town in 2014. And it is also the case that we are making the other towers work better. And so as you go around, you want that to happen. You know, we don't sit here and say, hey, this is Scarborough. Let's, uh, how many towers can we put in Old Orchard Beach without having to actually build any in the town? That's not how it works, because obviously every town could try to do that and push towers on to Scarborough, as well as maybe some people want to push the towers onto Old Orchard Beach. So, um, it's capacity, it's coverage, it's both of them, and it's necessary for the system to work. I think it's also important to note that <coughs> Ivan was hired by the Prouts Neck Association to comment on this project. He's not said, hey, this is only about capacity and Verizon is being disingenuous about their needs. He hasn't said there isn't a need here, because that would be problematic, because he said there was a need here in 2014 when he looked at it. And he hasn't even disagreed with the priority of locations. Ivan is undisputably a qualified radio frequency engineer. He's working for Prout's Neck, and what he offers today is, should you move the pole around on the sanitary district site, and should it be a stick instead of a monopine? And we appreciate that you need to run those issues to ground. We'll provide you the data about it, but Ivan is not saying that MGP doesn't know what they're doing. Ivan is not saying go use a Black Point fire station. Ivan is not saying, hey, you don't need cell phone coverage here, it's all fine. Um, he has not yet said that, and that's because none of those assertions are true. Um, and so there's a factual piece about buffers that you folks need to look at. There's probably a legal piece, not because you should care what I think, but you should care what your town attorney <laughs> thinks about looking at alternative heights. And then there's the RF piece. I think the RF piece is settled. You need to be comfortable with it, but I don't think anyone is telling you anything different than Verizon is about the need for the site, the need for a new tower, and the appropriateness of the sanitary district as that chosen location. Um, <clears throat> I can appreciate what you're saying, but what I'm hearing is something totally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we're getting uh, you know, a, a tremendous response from people saying they don't need this, and that's the struggle I'm having. And I'm wondering, when I asked the question, I was wondering, is this a technical requirement that Verizon and AT&T, for instance, need to maintain the technical viability of their whole system, more so than providing enhanced service for the end user. Well, no, no, it's, well, again, maybe, a, so it's all about providing better service for the end user. That's why the network is built up. Right now, the service for the end user is poor in this area of town. This site will make it better, and I think all of the engineers that have looked at it, our engineers, Keith, the Proud Snack engineer, Ivan, Modern Grid Partners, they've all looked at those and, and have concluded that 
Yes, we need a tower here. That's what the priority of locations is about. You have to confirm that there is a need for this site and that there isn't something where we should be hanging our antennas in, in lieu of, of a new tower. And the town determined back in 2014 that the end user needed something better and this was a problem area. We're doing this site because the end user, it needs to work better. Um, and the fact that somebody it works in their living room or it doesn't work all in these other locations, no, one tower doesn't solve every coverage problem. But this specific area was identified by the town as an area of poor coverage. Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint all agree the coverage is poor and something needs to happen. And yes, the, 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 TTO, the, the, the tower overlay district is drawn in this area, not because the town intended to beat up on the marsh, but because a new tower must go in this area of town. Doesn't matter how many moratoriums go into effect and how many times you revisit the ordinance, everyone agrees, every engineer that has been asked agrees that the end user, it's not working, and we need a site here. So our goal was to propose the shortest tower we could that would be able to be used by as many carriers as possible. And I've been doing this for 15 years. I have never had another carrier come knocking at the door halfway through a planning board proceeding, and I have two. And that tells me that there is a problem here in this area of Scarborough, and the carriers are lining up to use what is a relatively short pole in an area identified by the town. And we're hoping that the board sees that this has been responsive to the needs of, of the town. But we understand we need to drill down on the buffering and make sure that we're doing the best job possible. <laughs> Um, and we also appreciate at the end of the day, you could look at this and say, not good enough for me. Um, you can't have your permit, and that is ultimately for you folks to decide. Okay, I just have one last question. Um, I, I find it hard to believe that Sprint and AT&T want to go below you folks, because I think you said that the antennas have to be above the tree line to, be op you know, to operate properly. So how, how can that, I mean, that, that doesn't seem to be consistent. Well, because, I mean, in other words, in the extreme, it has to be above the tree line. So you can't do a 20 or 30 foot tower that's completely surrounded by vegetation. It is also true that vegetation could adversely impact the signal coming from these antennas. Each one of the carriers does its assessment. It figures out where it is, where their existing coverage is, what the vegetation looks like, they take into consideration tree leaves and the whole nine yards, and they run an assessment as to what elevation they need in order for it to work. And it may be difficult to understand, but part of the reason why it's difficult to understand is that AT&T and Sprint and T-Mobile, none of them will share this information with us, and they're not going to share it with you until they file a permit application. So we're left to kind of guess at what they might need they have run their systems. They don't co-locate on towers that don't work. If the trees in this area were a problem for Sprint or a problem for AT&T, they would just come in front of you with a request for a new tower um, or an extension on one of the existing towers. But they've indicated and they've applied to Verizon, which is the first step in the co-location process, to hang their equipment beneath us. Um, it's not just a little letter or a little email that was tossed in. It was an application to the company to co-locate on these two levels if the board approves a tower that goes at least up to 100 feet. So um, I suppose things could change, but um, it is uh, enormously less speculative that AT&T and Sprint are ready to go beneath us than it is to wonder about whether somebody in the future might be coming in above us. So, uh, you know, it's, I think it's helpful information and it suggests that this is a good site as identified by Ivan in the town four years ago. <laughs> I'm ready for round two, though, if you... Let's give you a break. Okay. <laughs> Rachel? Yeah, I, I was trying to think back to the conversation uh, around capacity um, that we had when you first came, and as I recalled, uh, I, I've heard folks reference the 30 people who live down on Prout's Neck. Um, as I recall, part of the conditions uh, in the problems were during the summer when a lot of people come into Scarborough and they spend a lot of money and they're down on the beach and they're renting houses and they're eating at our restaurants and they don't have cell phone service along Pine Point. But that becomes part of the question, I think, of capacity as, as I under, uh, understand it. And we did have 
that conversation. So I, I, yeah. I, I know, I, I recall the maps. I didn't bring them with me, but I, I do recall the maps showing the coverage. And we, ha we can drag, I see Chip is digging into the map, so if it's helpful, we can bring the maps over and talk about them, but you're right, well, it's, yeah, and, and about that, this. I mean, basically that's, you know, that's, I, I recall it might be helpful for uh, my folks, the folks on the board, or it might be helpful for the, the people here to, to see around the issue of, of the coverage uh, and the capacity. And, and from the beginning, it was clear that Higgins Beach and um, Piper Shores were not going to be covered, um, that they would need some sort of other provisions. Uh, and they do need other provisions. And no, the fire station isn't necessarily going to do that. Uh, no, thank you. No. So we have what we're looking at here. If you take a look at the current coverage. So for this, okay, so this in the green area shows the existing and proposed coverage in this area of town from the ones in black, which are the sites that are currently operational. And then when you flip, oh yeah, go ahead, Chip. I know this question's about Old Orchard Beach and what's that doing, and, and Scott was, made a good explanation earlier about um, how folks on uh, Black Point Road here, or, or rather on Prout's Neck, and then some of the areas of Prom, uh, uh, Pine Point benefit from sites outside of town. Uh, and Old Orchard Beach is one of those that we've talked about. Um, and these little black symbols, they look like blobs, but they actually mean something. Uh, the way that Keith has them plotted, uh, this piece of pie here is pointing in the direction of um, Prout's Neck and Pine Point. And it's this sector, as we call it. There's three sectors for each cell, cell site. The sector is pointing towards here. And so these green areas here are actually coming Service at service coming from Old Orchard Beach, and by today's standards, and Keith can get into this a little further, uh, we would define that as the unintended coverage. It's too great of an area to serve now, based on the demand and the need. One of the reasons why providing a site here will provide coverage, thereby offloading capacity on this site. I hope that helps. And then what we had gone through before is the plot showing the improvements in coverage associated with the site that we propose. It's both within this area, but it also touches areas in the perimeter and also allows the other sites to work as well. And it's right, it won't hit everything. Higgins Beach is in a hole. So you know, not every site can serve every area, but this area, again, was identified as one that needs, and it's not just to provide people with coverage down here. It's this entire area of town. It reaches up to where the fire station site is and the neighborhoods up there, and it reaches to the northeast into the areas up here where there's residential, residential areas and in the road system as people go back and forth. So, um, you know, what we do is we build sites that we need to address the expectations of the end user, and those decisions are made someplace in New Jersey that I'm not allowed to go, but um, we don't propose towers that are a waste of time and a waste of money and a, and a waste because they serve absolutely no purpose. So um, is there something else that needs to happen over by the Cape Elizabeth line at some point? Maybe so. Um, and, and there isn't a single tower that covers all areas, but this is uh, an incremental benefit that is deemed real for the folks that use this service and will provide significant benefits in the entire area um, as to how the network operates. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, my colleagues, and I suspect more will agree that we really need to take a hard look at the buffering. I appreciate your willingness to take a look at reciting uh, the tower uh, on the on the Scarborough uh, Sanitary District area. Um, I'm reminded again that uh, the overlay district requires a site with 25 acres, which doesn't give a lot of flexibility. Uh, not a lot of places left in Scarborough where there are kind of 25 available acres uh, for a tower. Uh, I do think we need to take a hard look at the definition of buffering and the amount of buffering that's, that's required uh, or that would be deemed necessary to ensure that the viewpoint from the marsh is as protected as possible. 
Uh, I understand that essentially we're looking at two different levels of buffering, and that is seen from ground level and then seen from a distance. And seen from a distance, we're never going to, it's never going to be entirely disappear because otherwise we would never uh, get any cell phone service out of it. But it might be possible to take a look at uh, some plantings of faster growing trees, the white pines or something in the area of the, the sanitary district using uh, what um, I believe a, uh, one of the folks back there talked about in terms of a vegetative easement uh, and providing more um, buffering, deeper buffering, might perhaps going into beyond your area that you've leased from the Scarborough Sanitary District uh, into that district itself with with some sort of an easement to really make that a robust buffered area. I've not come to any sort of a decision yet on you know whether I think a monopine or um, a stealth tower or a stealth brown stick whatever um, is is more appropriate so I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, the comparisons that we've talked about down there, comparing apples to apples mm -hmm. and oranges to oranges, and I think that will help me uh, come to a decision around the tower style. Okay. Uh, as a matter of pure curiosity, because frankly I thought we actually had passed the um, uh, determination on uh, priority of, of need, I thought we had done that. What, what, what did we do? Uh, I I can speak to that. I was planning to, but I, I, I will now that you've got okay, it up. Okay, well, and, and I've, so, other, yeah. th other than that, I'm... Sure. So as we've done in the past with, with similar processes, it was not a formal vote, but it was sort of a straw poll to, to get to confirm that there was a consensus on the board that we had reached that point, that the applicant had satisfied those criteria with the understanding that we're then moving on to discuss the performance standards. We had a quorum, and the people who were here were here, and that was the conversation that we had, and the, those, that was the determination that we made. Um, and so now we're moving on. At some point down the road, if we get to the point where, where we're contemplating an actual motion, then that would be formally um, memorialized in, in the form of findings. Um, but that was, that's, we, again, we've followed similar procedures in the past. And uh, one more thing, uh, I know one of, the, uh, one of the public had asked a question about lighting on the tower, and my understanding is that there is no light uh, that's proposed correct. because it falls under, under the height. Now, that's would correct. a light be required at the 120-foot level? No, the FAA requires lights when you hit 200 feet, um, so... Uh, it's well above the trigger for us at 100. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Rick? Almost um, last. Um, I have quite a few notes myself. Um, first, I want to thank the public for your comments. Um, I kayak myself and canoe on the marsh, and um, I share some of your sentiments. Um, we were talking about a hundred foot pole at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, there was some conversation and a big picture up here that I'm sure you saw of the, of the monopole. Um, the hundred foot pole we were talking about was a monopine. So, I do have a question, and, and like Nick, I'd like to see some, some pictures later on. Okay. Of, um, to get the same capacity, to get the same um, efficiency out of uh, how big would the monopole be versus the monopine? Yeah, so the, by the monopole, I think you're meaning the stick with the yeah. antennas inside. I mean, is that we're talking 120 yeah, that, feet? Yeah, so that would be 120 so, feet. So get the same performance That's right. as the, as the monopole, That's right. as the 100-foot uh, monopine. Okay, so that would be 100. So that would be like the picture I'd want to see if, if we could. It's a 100-foot model. And I know we've seen some. So, yeah. And, and, but if we could get something like that, that might help. All right. 
Um, there was some also some mention from the um, from the public, and it was good input uh, as far as emerging technologies. But um, currently, I, I'm an engineer. I work in this this field. Uh, I work for a power company, but we do AMI, which is the metering that someone was talking about. We do that all day long. Uh, I don't think that I think this is going to be the technology for a while, unfortunately. Uh, there, there, there's some spectrum running new fiber met networks all the time. Um, but this pole, if it goes in, it's probably going to be here a while. Um, if there was a fourth carrier, if uh, T-Mobile decided to, to go on that pole, would it would uh, in in your opinion or or did, would they need that extra 20 feet or could they go low? Well, that's what we don't know. I mean, frankly, I, I'm not sure we thought AT&T could go at 76 or 78, yeah. and you saw in Modern Grid Partners comments that you just got, basically a blanket rejection that that wouldn't work. And I think it just it highlights the difficulty of figuring out what the other carriers need because the information to make that decision is not publicly available. So right. it, it kind of depends where um, uh, T-Mobile's other sites are and um, what their coverage objectives are as to whether or not it would work underneath that. Um, so we just don't know. Okay. But I think what, what we all heard here tonight was if, if, if we approve a 100-foot tower, the, the, the grades that can ever go, even with the spectrum law and the federal act, it would be 120 feet. That's correct. Okay. At least that, that's, that's the most you could do under that federal provision. All right. I think if you recall, uh, I wasn't here for the last meeting, but the meeting before that when we were talking about discovery and, and other sites, mm -hmm. um, we spoke about the fire station, and I, and I heard about that tonight. We all talked about that a little bit. Um, I was so adamant about that site that I actually took a drive over there, and I walked that site, and I had one of the firemen come out and ask me who I was and what <laughs> I was doing. Didn't recognize me. I'm on TV every third Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Did you give them an I'm hoping attack? that works if I get pulled over someday, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that site's tight. Um, you, you know, it, it's not just the, it's for the public's benefit, and, I, and you guys already know this, it's not just the stick, it's, it's not just the tower itself, it's the support equipment that goes along with it. And um, if we tore down, if you tore down half the fire station, you might be able to fit the equipment in there, but you'd have to get rid of a couple trucks. I don't think they're going to do that. So... I really wanted to see that site work because I didn't want to see this pole in the marsh. Mm -hmm. But uh, after doing my own personal site walk, I don't think that's a viable option. You know, this is tough because I know there's a lot of people here that showed up tonight, and uh, I'm very passionate about this. Um, th there are some emails from some other folks, uh, much more, more people sent emails against it than were for it. But there, there were some people that that uh, did respond positively. Um, obviously, they aren't here tonight, and I don't think I would have shown up here tonight either <laughs> if I was in favor of it. Um, but the the purpose of this board is is really to, to do make sure people follow the rules, and you know we want to do what's right for this town. We all live here. Um, and there's basically we can approve this or we can reject it. If we approve it, this is just the site plan review. It's not final approval tonight, and the chairman will go over that. But, but uh, you know, if we approve it, it goes on to the next step. If we reject it, you, you might think that's it. It's over, right? No more tower. That's not over. It's not over. You follow the rules, you follow the rules. Um, you know, we've seen that. We've seen taxpayer money wasted on litigation that, that didn't have to happen. Um, so the best we can do is, is to make sure that everyone follows the rules and, and make sure that, that uh, we all get to see what a monopine looks worth versus a monopole and come up with the best solution that we can. Um, you know, it would be great to say I don't want this in my backyard. I got a fire chief telling me he might need it. Um, no, he does need it. Uh, 
So um, I'd like to see what the best options are. And I'm going to go through the ordinance again and, and, and look for any way, you know, anything that we can find that, that uh, would improve this project. But currently, I'll be honest with you, what I see is um, there's nothing that I see that, that doesn't fall within the guidelines. And we could attempt to change those guidelines, but <coughs> it's not retroactive. Um, so I was sad to hear it wasn't going to help Higgins Beach, though, because that's an area that needs some support. Um, no, I guess I'll end it there. I, you know, we've heard a lot of things here uh, over the last few meetings, and, and you know, people talk about capacity and coverage and and voice over IP, so why do you need your phone, right? Well, my Netflix drops off every other day. Um, you need your phone. You, you, it's not, I don't even have a phone on my wall anymore. A lot of people don't. Um, it's important. It's important for a lot of things. So um, I'd like to see those pictures and. Uh, okay. You know, we'll, we'll take a good hard look at the rules, but we don't make the rules. We just have to make sure people follow them. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse Mr. me. Mr. Chair, um, if, if I could, just sure, one Jack. quick point, uh, uh, point of clarification. Uh, for, for Rick, um, I just want to make sure you're aware um, in your packet that we had an updated letter from the public safety fire chief saying that they actually don't intend to co-locate at this tower, that they found other alternatives and that they can um, get what they need using the existing um, flagpole tower, as it's being called, at the Black Point Fire Station. So I just sort of heard oh, you. Oh, it's good so to know. I want just be sure. Yeah, to I didn't see that. No. <laughs> I don't want to throw all. Thanks, Jay. Um, so certainly, again, a lot of good comments from the public and from my board colleagues. And uh, I don't want to, following my own directive from <laughs> earlier, I don't want to be too repetitive. Um, to I guess to pick up on what Rick was saying, uh, and and uh, Nick alluded to this as well as have other board members, um, the notion that. You know that we don't we don't write the rules we don't write the ordinance and I think unfortunately it, while it's clearly been perceived by some uh, at least a couple people who spoke tonight as as that being sort of a cop out this notion that we're quote hiding behind the ordinance we're seeking refuge in the ordinance um, that's literally what we're sworn to do is to enforce the ordinances um, in some cases it's very prescriptive in some cases we have some discretion. Um, there may be times when some people have an honest disagreement over how we may be interpreting the ordinance, and that's fine. But um, that's what we're charged with. We're a quasi-judicial body, and um, we are charged with interpreting and enforcing, enforcing those ordinances. Um, we take that very seriously. I mean, I, I honestly, I always sort of cringe a little bit when I do hear board members criticizing an ordinance or I don't like the way this is written and so forth because it's again it's fine to have that opinion but um, the ordinance is what it is we're not a legislative body we can feel free to provide our opinion to the to the town council as appropriate whether as a board or just as citizens of the town but when we're here with an application in front of us with an applicant who is entitled to avail themselves of the ordinance and the process that's there um, then we take it at face value um, and we do the best we can uh, to enforce it. Um, and on that note of uh, sort of the, this notion of, of the applicant and their motivations, and I think I said this last time as well or maybe the time before, uh, but I, I don't think the applicant is doing this because it's fun, uh, even though they are the only ones who are paid to be here, um, aside from our our skilled planning board, planning staff. Um, 
And again, I think based on everything that we've seen and heard, I take their motivations, their motives, and their responses at face value. I have no reason to think that there's some pernicious ulterior motive. Um, and I, I don't think it's really appropriate to, to question that. Um, going back to this, the, the theme of enforcing the ordinance, certainly, we're, as, as was noted correctly, um, when it comes to uh, the performance standards and things like buffering, though, those are areas where we certainly do have some discretion. And we can sort of go, and, go above and beyond the bare minimum in terms of what we recommend or request. <coughs> and I will join my fellow board members who um, requested that the applicant uh, be prepared to go above and beyond and, and not rely on, on existing vegetation. I also would like to see additional um, visuals of different uh, <coughs> pole types and heights from, you know, from common vantage points. Um, and I appreciate that the applicant has expressed a willingness to consider um, different positioning within, within the site. Um, we can maybe have a separate discussion as a board and with staff about whether a site visit may be appropriate. I'm not sure how much, you know, just off the top of my head, uh, how much we'd be able to see or whether that would move the needle, but uh, I appreciate that suggestion. Um, and then I, as, I, as I think I suggested at the, at, the, at the top of the meeting or at the top of this particular item, um, you know, we're clearly not, a, not at a point where we're prepared to consider any sort of approvals, but I think um, it's been a helpful discussion. I hope it has been for everyone. I do want to make one more comment. Um, you know, there were, there was a, it was pointed out that I made reference last time to the fact that there are other man-made objects that are visible from the marsh. And I certainly did not intend for that to be you know, dismissive. And I think I did say at the time that that by no means is a suggestion that we should disregard um, buffering concerns or that we want to repeat past mistakes. Um, it was really just a, a comment on sort of, you know, a little bit of perspective and the, and the recognition that as the applicant has stated pretty bluntly, at the end of the day, no matter how aggressively buffered this is or what the height is, by definition, it will be visible. So, and I appreciate the, the, that the applicant is being upfront about that. Um, and at the end of the day, it may be that the board determines that, you know, that, that there's just um, not an acceptable way to, uh, to adequately buffer it. But um, it has to be somewhat visible in order to be effective. And so that was really my point. That, and I, I also this idea that um, I think the, you know, the, the marsh, is not necessarily degraded by the fact that you can see something sticking up above the trees a little bit. And again, that's not to be dismissive. I'm just trying to bring a little bit of perspective, at least as I see it, into it. So again, I hope people appreciate that we do take this very seriously, and I don't think we need to go through all of our bona fides again about how much we care about the marsh and the Scarborough, but we do. Um, and hopefully the applicant has is clear on sort of the homework from this point, and some of that will involve coordination with staff, mm -hmm. and um, we will see where it goes from there. And just to clarify, so <clears throat> we're going to work on the buffering and the micrositing within the site, talk to the sanitary district. We're going to figure out how to present you with simulations of the apples to apples. And just the third thing, picking up on Nick's point, I think <coughs> it's, it, it, he makes a good point, which is, what do we do about this other 20 feet, and how is it relevant? I think staff is kind of suggested that maybe it's relevant. MGP has suggested it might be relevant. I think it would be good to run a missive by the town attorney to advise the board on how you might look at that and maybe other limits to it. I'm uh, more than willing to be disagreed with by a town attorney again. So, But I think it would be helpful for you to get some feedback from the town attorney on it to govern your, your assessment and your deliberations going forward. I'm willing to tee up kind of an initial, here are my thoughts so that they don't have to imagine what I'm thinking and they can just respond and advise you and I could coordinate that through Jay and Jamal if, that, if the board thought that would be helpful. I believe it would be. <coughs> I'm seeing at least a couple other people nodding. Okay. So. All right, so those are the three things on our list and we'll coordinate with 
staff on timing uh, when we're ready to come back before you and we appreciate once again uh, I know this is a lot of time by a lot of people out of their regular lives and no they're not being paid to be here so uh, we appreciate the public comment and the yeah. interest we appreciate the comments by the board um, and we'll continue to try to get information together to help people understand this site better and so that you can make your decision so thanks for your time thank you thanks again to everyone <laughs> We'll allow a minute here for folks to clear out before we finish off our agenda. Folks, we do have a couple of we do have a couple of housekeeping items that we need to take care of as a board. So the meeting is still still uh, in progress. Thank you. All right, in the interest of time, let's just keep on going. Do we have a staff report? Uh, yes. Excuse me, everyone. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse we us. are still in session. We have, a, we have some, some board business to, to finish, so thank you very much. Uh, so sure, as a staff report, one thing that folks may be, I'm sure, interested to in know, we have received our DEP permit for the public safety building, so we expect groundbreaking very soon. I don't, I'm not sure if it's been scheduled officially, but very soon, so that's exciting news. Yeah. Um, also let board members know that our, uh, uh, we're underway. We've kicked off with the Route 1 um, corridor study. This is really looking at access <coughs> management issues, um, intersections, sort of uh, the uh, uh, signal facilities that we have, crosswalks and those sorts of things. And we'll be working closely with the Transportation Committee on that over the next year. And of course, once that's uh, sort of near fin finalization, we'll let the Planning board know because we certainly access management along Route One is something that we bump, bump up against seemingly uh, quite frequently. So I think to have a plan in place and know <coughs> direction would be good. Those are the two items I had to report. Thank you. I have a quick item. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Um, we do have a mylar for the Fengler Woodlands Fourth Amended Subdivision Plan uh, for the board to sign before they go home tonight. It's right over there. And one other quick one, I just remembered. Uh, typically we do an end of the year workshop, sort of just get together before our last meeting. So if folks are interested in doing that again this year, that would be on, I think it would be December 10th, if I'm not mistaken. So um, we'll send an email. We usually have some food for that. Yep, we have right. a little food and yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty light discussion. Just try to get together without yeah. always sort of. Have like a Christmas party. <laughs> You can't call it We're not doing a Yankee swap. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Staff will put on quite a show. Right. <laughs> uh, did we have any administrative amendments? We've had one since the last meeting at the Prompto Oil uh, site on Route 1. There was a relocation of an employee access door from the east to west side uh, administratively approved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any planning board correspondence beyond everything that we've all been copied on. <laughs> all right. Planning board comments. All right. Move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Tonight. Anybody know uh, what the Patriots want? I, I recorded the shit. We don't want to know. <laughs> don't know. You're going to go home a Hell yeah. Here's the uh, mylar to sign before you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to drink. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but yeah, I.